Ahead on Boston Public Radio, parental burnout. A mere two-thirds of America's mothers and fathers feel it. Oh, my God, are you among them? Then Suffolk County District Attorney Kevin Hayden will discuss his new plan for handling arrests at Mass and Cass and how his office is handling young kids attacking people in downtown Boston who he says are too young to prosecute. Undocumented immigrants may soon be able to get driver's licenses in Massachusetts. Kelly Crossy will join us to discuss that and one million COVID deaths with barely a mention. All that ahead on Boston Public Radio 89.7 GPH. Live from NPR News in Washington, I'm Corva Coleman. The Labor Department says U.S. hiring was robust in April. It says 428,000 new jobs were created and the monthly unemployment rate remained at 3.6 percent. President Biden travels to Ohio this afternoon. He is scheduled to speak about the U.S. economy and job creation. From member station WVXU, Tana Weingartner reports... Biden will visit a manufacturing plant in suburban Cincinnati. President Biden will tour the global headquarters of United Performance Metals in Hamilton, Ohio, just north of Cincinnati. The company deals in specialty metals and alloys, utilizing processes like additive manufacturing. Biden is using the stop to talk about his efforts to create manufacturing jobs and make more products in the U.S. He'll also call on Congress to support the Bipartisan Innovation Act, a mashup of separate House and Senate measures aimed at making the U.S. more competitive, especially in areas like semiconductor manufacturing. Ohio made headlines earlier this year when Intel announced it's investing more than $20 billion to build two such chip factories here. For NPR News, I'm Tana Weingartner. The U.N. says it's working to evacuate more civilians from Ukraine's besieged city of Mariupol. Hundreds of people have escaped this week, but the U.N. warns more people are trapped. There are questions about what information the U.S. shared with Ukraine when it fired missiles at Russia's main warship in the Black Sea. The Moskva sank last month after the Ukrainian strike. Pentagon spokesman John Kirby says the U.S. routinely shares certain limited intelligence with Ukraine, but he told CNN the U.S. did not offer information about the Russian warship. We did not provide specific targeting information about the Moskva to the Ukrainians. We weren't involved in, in their decision uh, to conduct that strike, and we certainly weren't involved in the actual execution of that strike. He says it's not in the interests of anyone for the conflict in Ukraine to become a war between the U.S. and Russia. Every day, more than a dozen people in the U.S. die while waiting for a new organ, and people of color are disproportionately affected. NPR's Amy Held reports a new initiative aims to combat disparities and save more lives. A consortium of medical schools at historically black colleges and universities is seeking to make transplants more equitable, improving access, and providing opportunities for black medical students, school kids, and the broader community to learn more about transplants and become a donor. Black Americans make up more than a quarter of those on the wait list for a new organ. They are three times more likely than white Americans to develop kidney failure, the number one needed organ. In all, transplants are increasing up nearly 6% last year with more than 40,000 performed. But to even be considered for one, recipients have to make it onto the wait list. And historic patterns of discrimination, like getting to a doctor to make the referral, can be an obstacle. Amy Held, NPR News. On Wall Street, the Dow is down 110 points. This is NPR. Good morning from the GBH Radio Newsroom here in Brighton. I'm Henry Santoro. Residents of Somerville, of Somerville can once again sign up for free cab rides to access food and medical care through its Taxi to Health program. The program uses funds from the American Rescue Plan and it provides residents with free cab rides to grocery stores, food pantries, farmers markets and pharmacies in Somerville and its surrounding cities and towns. The program is administered jointly by the Council on Aging and the Office of Food Access and Healthy Communities. Residents can book rides directly through the city or they can request vouchers to use in the future. And rides should be booked at least two business days in advance, they say. 
Cape Cod Community College is getting federal funds to inspire the next generation of cyber stars. The funding from the National Security Agency, or NSA, will help the college offer cybersecurity programming for middle school students across the region during a science camp that's taking place this summer. Four C's, President John Cox says that cybersecurity is a booming industry right now, and he's excited to show the possibilities to the next generation. In sports, the Bruins are hoping for a win tonight against the Hurricanes. The Bees are down two games to none in the playoffs. Red Sox open a weekend series with the Chicago White Sox at Fenway tonight. First pitch is at 7:10, And dust off that fancy hat, the Kentucky Derby is tomorrow. In the forecast, sun clouds, low 60s today. It's 61 under a partly cloudy sky in Boston right now. I'm Henry Santoro. This is GBH News. Support for NPR comes from NPR stations. Other contributors include Fisher Investments. Fisher Investments is a fiduciary, which means they always put clients' interests first. Fisher Investments, clearly different money management. Investing in securities involves the risk of loss. It might be cloudy outside, but it's nice and sunny inside the Boston Public Library, thanks to Jim, Marjorie, and Boston Public Radio. Hey, Jim Browdy. I am Marjorie Egan. You are listening to Boston Public Radio 89.7 GBH, and we are broadcasting live as we do every Tuesday and every Friday from the Boston Public Library, where today we're going to have a little concert at the end of the show. We are, and thank you all for coming, by the way. We really appreciate it. I have actually a few programming announcements to make before we start. We're also streaming live today on YouTube.com slash GBH News. But I would suggest you not just do the streaming. I would show up. We have a hell of a show. We do. We have the DA of Suffolk County. We have Kelly. We have Cy Montgomery in studio with a brilliant new book called The Hawk's Way. We have Margaret Marshall, the former Chief Justice of the Supreme Judicial Court, who obviously made the first uh, decision in America almost 20 years ago, embracing same-sex marriage. We're going to talk to her about what impact she thinks this row overturning will have on that. And finally, the brilliant Metropolitan Chorale. They're not just going to sing today several times, Marjorie. They also have a tap dancer. Tap dancing dancing. on the radio. I know. It doesn't (laughs) get much uh, better. And final programming (laughs) announcement, which we're really excited about. On Monday, we are joined by Dr. Anthony Fauci. First time we've had him on the show, and I know I speak for Marjorie. We are thrilled. First, a new report out this week from Ohio State University found that Two-thirds of parents in this country meet the criteria for parental burnout. That's two-thirds. I know what you're thinking. We're not talking about run-of-the-mill tiredness that comes with being a parent. This is real, true emotional and physical exhaustion to the point where the World Health Organization recognizes it as a syndrome. It's worth noting the survey was originally done in the winter of 21, which was not the easiest winter in recent memory. Even still, we thought we'd open the lines to you parents out there and kids to hear how you're juggling it all and what you're doing to separate the parent part of you from the person part of you if you're managing to create any space at all, that is. Are you feeling totally fried? What would you bring you back to yourself? Give us a buzz or a text at 877-301-8970. Again, that's texting or calling. You can email at bprwgbh.org and tweet us at BOS Public Radio. And I'm going to beat Marjorie to the punch. The story on this in the New York Times, <laughs> the least surprising part of the study, 68% of working mothers say they're burnt out, while just 42% of working dads <laughs> yep. said the same why thing. I wonder why. are we not why. surprised? No. 877-301-8970. Are you surprised by the numbers? Admittedly, it was no, mid-pandemic. No, no, no. I mean, I, I mean, it's really, there's 24 hours in a day, right? Yeah. You're going to work at your job eight hours. You're supposed to commute back and forth. You're going to get up in the morning. If your kids are little, you got to either care. find, if, you know, get them to daycare, which is a big production. You know, you got to get the food for the daycare, all the stuff for the daycare. You've got to pick them up in daycare on time. You're sitting in rush hour traffic at 5 Five o'clock in the afternoon, trying to get to the daycare on time or the after-school program on time, where they charge you, you know, by the minute if you're late, right? So if you're ten minutes late, you're up to ten bucks. I can add up if you're late every day. Then you're gonna go home, make dinner. Well, no, don't leave that. If you, th- you get, you pay every minute, and if you're thirty minutes late, they take your kid to DCF. That's right. And that's <laughs> the end. Right? That's right. That's the end of the kid. So no, it's just, it's just. I always, I always, uh, I'm a big fan of Gloria Steinem. 
big feminist leader back in the 70s. You know what Gloria Steinem never had? Kids. Children. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so a lot of her, uh, you know, her prescriptions about how we we're going to solve Absolutely. things with a helpful husband, they just uh, haven't worked out that way. So I'm not surprised at all. And by the way, there is, I have been rhapsodizing for days about this great piece by a woman named Jessie Klein, K-L-E-I-N. She writes for The Cut, which is mm -hmm. a New York magazine. This is from her, uh, from her wonderful book about uh, motherhood and uh, talking about the heroic journey of being a mother. We always talk about Odysseus, you know, everybody's out there, they're fighting the wolves, they're fighting the big armies, they're fighting this, while the mothers are at home taking care of the kids. She talks about how the real heroic journey is at home, where the exhausted, overwhelmed mother is trying not to really just throw the kids in the closet and walk out of the room <laughs> forever, you know? So it's, it's great stuff, I love all this stuff. Our number is 877-301-8970. When the show's over, if you're wondering where you are on the scale of burnout parent, this Ohio State University attached to it are 10 statements with which you agree not at all, a little, somewhat. They're like item one, I get or feel easily irritated with my children. Who would say I don't? feel that. Did you when you were I, kids were I young? Think you're, I think you're irritated all the time. I and feel that I am not the good parent that I used to be to my children. I wake up exhausted at the thought of another day with my children. <laughs> I have guilt about being a working parent, which affects how I parent my children, on and on and on. 877-301-8970. I knew a woman once, I actually knew her fairly well, who said to me once, when her kids were not little, but they were college age, she called me on the day that her kids <laughs> were about to return to college, and she said to me on the phone, free at last, free at last. Thank you know who that God was, Almighty, by the way? I'm free at last. Who was that? It was I. It yeah. was you. Uh, yes, uh, it was. Well, you know, that's, that's the thing. I love my children, she you're, said. You're crazy about your kids. You love your kids, but it's constant exhaustion, frustration, patience, never-ending patience. It is really hard to raise, to raise children. I think that's one of the things. I, I am a feminist. I'm a big fan of the women's movement, but I think that's one of the things that uh, we fail to consider that raising children is very time consuming and still then as now is mothers who are doing most of it. Well, you know, I, I would like to say, by the way, our number is 877-301-8970. Again, you can text us at that number. You can call us at that number, 877-301-8970. I have to say my experience as a father when my kids were young, they're now 28 and 30, it was very different. I didn't feel burnout at all. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I felt totally relaxed yeah. and not stressed. That's I, I right. don't know what that was. That's but it right. Was totally yeah. fine. Well, you are the dad and not the mom. Oh, well, whatever. 877 301 897. Can I have help from somebody for a second moving this uh, Comrex screen a little bit? 877 301 8970. Let's start with Rachel in Framingham. Hi, Rachel. Hey, Rachel. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, guys. I love your show, and this Thanks. is an awesome topic. Thanks so much for taking it. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm a visiting nurse in Metro West. My, um, so my job, obviously, for the pandemic was pretty crazy. It was kind of exacerbated by the fact that I had two small children. Um, and at the beginning of the pandemic, they covered out here in Metro West daycare for the kids. But that only lasted about two months. Oh. And then after that stopped, <laughs> My uh, one child, could, I could afford daycare for one child, but I was a single parent. I couldn't do it for both. So as a result, my eight-year-old would be in the car with me while I was going to see patients doing homeschooling from the car. From the I car? Was, uh, from the car. He would be um, in the back of my car running internet off of my cell phone doing school while I was going in to home to see COVID patients. That wasn't um, stressful so at all, was it, Rachel? <laughs> As a result, to say that my children and I are attached to the hip, probably in a crazy way of that is probably not healthy for anyone, is an <laughs> understatement. You know, <laughs> my 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 eight year old at the time is now ten, and it's like dealing with a little adult. You know, because now he's seen more medical crises than you could imagine, and it, you know he he he's used to being with me in a work environment. So it's just like you know trying to send him to any sort of normal child thing is insane. You know Rachel, something, thanks. hold on for one quick call. thing, it's a home nurse, Rachel. I've often read enviously of other countries where after uh, moms give birth, they send nurses to the home to check on how mom's doing with the newborn baby. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? 
any sort of anything that anyone would do for a mother with a newborn baby in this country would be welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry, they're not doing it but anytime yeah. soon. Rachel, thank you for a great call. Here's a text from 7274. We have only one child, and both of us have relatively flexible jobs. Given that, we are toast. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> one kid with relatively flexible jobs. 877-301. 89, and for this great Jesse Klein piece, which I'm going to be quoting all day, she talks about how you know you're not really supposed to admit a lot. Of, you're supposed to be in this, you know, oh my God, the, the Messiah is born, and I'm just in <laughs> bliss all the time. And she says, you, what you have to do is swallow the pain and frustration. She says, no one wants to know that after your mother finally placed you in the crib, she walked out of the room and screamed into a blanket or cried in the bathroom or drank a bottle of wine or all of the above. No one wants to know that if she rocked you and sang you the 10th lullaby of the night, she was fantasizing about putting you down, walking out the door, and never coming back. A mother's heroic journey is not about how she leaves, but how she stays. Well, that's pretty good. By pretty the way, good. A texter from 8919 said, My husband was a teacher. I sang it when he left, too. So <laughs> it's, apparently it's not just. Uh, uh, 877-301-8970. Jamie is our lead producer who's got an under two-year-old. In the middle of recent potty training of our toddler, I did find myself Googling how to get a new family. <laughs> At least people are, are honest. Amy in Worcester. You are next on Boston Public Radio, live from the Boston Public Library. Welcome. Hi, hi. How are you? Excellent. Great. How are you? Uh, better now. So I left my job in January. I was a middle school principal. And I left my job in January. Totally burnt out. Um, my child would, you know, really bear the brunt of my frustration and my burnout. Um, I was easily irritated, the very first uh, indicator you talked yeah, yeah, about. Yeah. And once I left, I have the energy to go outside and play with him. When he comes home from school, I, can, I make him breakfast in the morning. I can't stay not working forever. I will be going back to work. But um, it's just been such a nice relief from the craziness of the last two years, especially in the education field. Do you feel um, screwed, though, that you had to give that up to be able to not be stressed by uh, your other oh, responsibility? Yeah. Yes, it has been. It, I, I have said to multiple people, you either get to work or you get to enjoy life. You don't get to do both. Yeah. Wow. And that's, it, it's irritating, and it, you really feel robbed, especially in, you know, right now I'm door dashing. That's what I'm doing for, you know, just to make some extra money. And it's no stress. It's easy. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not fair. It's not fair it's to not families, fair. especially I'm a single parent on top of it. So, Well, it if you lived in virtually any other way. Western democracy, you wouldn't have had to quit your job to do that, by the way. But I guess we all know that. Amy, thanks for the call. By the way, I totally blew the punchline from that person who... Said they're toast? No, when, about the, the husband. Her first text, which I missed, was when my kids went back to school every September, I sang, quote, it's the most wonderful day of the year all day. And then she went on to say, my hu husband was a teacher. I sang when he left, too. <laughs> so sorry that I buried the uh, punchline there. 877-301-8970. By the way, we didn't intend this to be a serious thing, but it is true. Every call, every text, everything in these stories is in great part you know what? a function of the inability wonder, to get accessible, yeah, affordable childcare. But part, you know, why don't we take to the streets about this? Why don't we put up with this in the United States? We just had an opportunity to get a bill passed that would have enabled people to get to pay 7% of their income. That's it, 7% of your income for childcare. Was there, was there a march Max, in Washington about this? No, there wasn't. I mean, that, but that was in Build Back Better. Build Back Better, but which sort basically of the went down. Plan, exactly, by the way, which, went, by which went down the shoots. Why, I mean, think about that. How, now that impacts your stress level, your financial Marjorie, level? forget, we never had that. We had a child, uh, an increased, expanded child, child tax, tax credit. credit. Right. That disappeared. disappeared. Once again, another example of something we had 
that is now gone. Yeah, I'll say one thing for the French, man. They try to take two minutes off their work week. They are taken to the streets and by, by the hundreds of thousands. We just get kicked in the pants all the time, and we take it. There's something really oddly passive Well, let's see how we us. react to Roe v. Wade, by the way, too, which well, we've been talking well, about all see. week. Well, let's see. Let's see. I hope it's different, but I'm not sure it it's going to be enough. Elias is complaining that we're not... Uh, that we're always talking about the moms instead of the dads, but the truth of the matter is uh, that he may be very exhausted and burnt out, but the, the bulk of it in most situations is on moms, not on dads. Well, you know, well, I want to challenge you there. I mean, I don't think that's fair because having spoken to a lot of dads myself of young kids, playing golf every weekend is really <laughs> it's taxing. <laughs> you miss the kids and the mother or the <coughs> co-parent or whatever. Eight seven seven three zero one. 89, uh, 70. By the way, this is for you, Marjorie. Jesse Klein was on Fresh Air with uh, Terry Gross, which obviously this is one of, oh one my of our God. Texas. Yeah. I have her podcast. I'll have to listen to it because I absolutely love Jesse. I'm in love, obviously, with Jesse Klein. I think she's, but she talked about the heroic journey of the mothers. You know, it's not going outside, it's going deep <laughs> inside and getting inner strength. And I think she's really nailed it. Emily and Bo uh, Newton, you're next on Boston Public Radio. Thanks for calling. Hi. Hi. So Hi. this. Uh, issue made me think about when I, oh, I guess I should turn off the volume. Um, Thank you. When I was 19, I lived in Venezuela for six months, and oh. it was such a stark difference in the way that they lived because the aunts, uncles, cousins, grandparents, everyone lived close by. Yeah. And so yeah. no one was expected to be raising children by themselves. And I just, I feel like for all the moms in particular who are so stressed out, like, you're stressed out for a reason. We're not supposed to be living so isolated in the way, I mean, they could not believe that I had a dad in one state, a mother in another state, grandparents in another state. They just, they just thought it was crazy. And so, you know, I just think we probably didn't evolve to live to have the two parents struggling to raise their kids, work, do all this stuff by themselves. So when my kids were little, there was an, I, had a, I was very fortunate to have a network of moms, and we all stepped up and helped one another. That's great. So I just, I, I just hope that anyone who's feeling so stressed out just, you know, has some, has Go, is gentle with themselves because there's a reason you're so stressed out. And Emily, the government should be stepping up to do a lot more. You know, you raise, you raise a great point. I mean, the people that I know with young children who have family nearby, it is a totally different existence totally different. because the grandparents can babysit, which eases financial strain. And also the, you know, the, all the, the emotional strain you go through of first bringing a kid to daycare, first having a nanny that you don't, that you don't know and who's taking care of the kid. It really, the, we, the nuclear family is not, good for a lot of things, and child rearing is one of them. Yeah, right? but can I be, a, Emily, thanks for calling. Can I be a broken record? Sure. I mean, it, there are a lot of uh, nations that don't have that culture that Venezuela, as mm -hmm. Emily said, or Japan has, for example, and that's where government steps in to fill the holes. So for the most part, we have neither, with some exceptions. Now somebody just said that, oh, she, uh, Mar answer to my, why don't we take to the streets? She says to me, Marjorie, we can't take to the streets because we're worked to death. And we feel that too if they keep us working forever, we can't protest anything because we will be too exhausted. But that's a very good point. Thank you very much. Let's go to Colleen in Easton. Thank you for calling, Colleen. Hi. Um, this is uh, my first time calling, but I listen all the time. Well, thank you for um, both. I just wanted to... <laughs> I just wanted to chime in, and um, I'm a um, working mother of four, but my younger two were in college when the pandemic hit, and I just need, and that was, it was stressful raising four children and working not in a pandemic, and yeah. I just need a shout out to all those parents of young children you. who were raising their kids. I cannot even imagine what it must have been like or what it must be like and the fallout from that to the schedules and you know, it's it's no wonder that parents are feeling yeah. stressed because it's stressful in, in normal. what we say normal yeah. time. Yeah, exactly. So well, you, you know, made a great I, point, you know, Colleen. I'm in the neighborhood with lots of kids, and, and I just would watch these parents and marvel and say, oh, my yeah. gosh, this was a really good time in my life for a pandemic to hit because my children were so much older. Yeah, Ours that's, too. that's Colleen, that's, great first call. Well, Thanks now, for making it. Well, now, sadly, all the, the, the research is coming in that we really overestimated the danger of sending kids back to school. We would have done, been much better off had we sent the kids back to school earlier because the learning loss was awful and the trauma was awful, and there's a fear that it's not going to be caught up on. Now, before we take a break, let me read this text from 7775. Yep. As a parent of two kids who are 18 months apart, when my adorable but rambunctious son was a toddler, more than once I Googled, quote, how do you know if your kid is a sociopath? <laughs> it's not just people with small kids. 
<laughs> when your kids are in elementary school, <clears throat> the stress and pressure don't change much. Mine are nine and ten. But then, that's but then good. from nine and ten, you can look forward to the teen years, right? Where your kids oh, think you're the easy. biggest <laughs> jerk going from the age of eleven till about the age of twenty-five, and you have to worry about drinking, drugs, sex, all those other things. So it just never, it just never ends. We're getting our stories and solutions to parental burnout off a newly published study showing two-thirds of parents in the United States show signs of chronic burnout. It's such a big deal. The World Health Organization, Jim, yeah, has recognized this as a syndrome. Yep. Anyway, we're going to keep taking your calls and texts after this break. The number 877-301-8970. You can email us at bprwgbh.org or tweet us at Boss Public Radio. We are broadcasting live from the Boston Public Library. World's Newsroom is following events in Ukraine. We don't want to see Vladimir Putin feeling as if he is in a corner. We with were to lose. sleeping and we heard explosions. The Ukrainian anthem starts with the phrase Ukraine is not dead yet. Our coverage from Ukraine and stories from all around the globe, it's on the world. This afternoon at 3, here on GBH News 89.7. Support for our programs comes from you and the British International School of Boston, committed to helping students achieve academically, personally, and socially through global learning opportunities. Spaces available for the fall. Learn more at bisboston.org. And the Mass General Cancer Center, working to define the future of cancer care with innovative research and clinical trials that provide access to tomorrow's therapies today. Learn more at massgeneral.org cancer. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Browdy, Mark Regan, live at the Boston Public Library and streaming on YouTube at youtube.com slash gbhnews. But trust me, today you should be here. If you're just joining us, we're talking about this study out of Ohio State that confirms what we've all felt over the last couple of years. Working parents are approaching, surpassing in some cases, clinical levels of burnout. It's a kind of exhaustion, as one clinical social worker put it, where you've been, quote, giving and giving and giving and giving until you're totally empty. We want to know if you're empty. Give us a call, 877-301-8970. It's also the text line. I got a couple of good emails from dads. Paul says, hi, my daughter just got out of the terrible twos. She turned 23. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. Ernie says, and this is a great point, isn't some of it self-imposed? I'm just two years removed from having 15 games and activities per weekend with three kids, that's a big thing too. And when you get to the teen years, it gets even worse because if they're playing sports after school, then you're trying to figure out how you get your kids track meet while you're supposed to be at work and how you get to the soccer game and how you get to the practices and that becomes a carpool nightmare. And I mean, the, it's just, um, it's hard. I guess that's obvious. No, that's a very insightful point. I, I would agree insightful. with that. I think there's a consensus. It is really hard. And Jamie and Bill Ricca, you are next on Boston Public Radio. Thank you for the call, hi. Hi, folks. Hey to you. I want to, uh, uh, long time listener, I want to thank you for the uh, great guest commentators you have on regular. I feel better and informed about the world uh, every time uh, you have such great guests oh, on. Oh, thank you. Thanks, so do we. Uh, What's up? As far as the, the parenting goes, I was thinking about how the public tax system affects that, and I'd love to have a discussion about how. Our tax code could better support parents, but there's one thing that makes me hesitate to do that, and it's something I hear you guys say all the time. What? You say, X billionaire, Y millionaire didn't pay any taxes. But that's really inaccurate. What that actually means is they didn't owe any taxes. So I think your argument is really with the IRS, or with Congress for how they set up the tax code. Well, That's Jamie, you're figure. a you're a much more charitable person than I. One, we don't know because we don't get their tax returns. Who's creatively, legally using the tax code? Who, for example, uh, the former president, you may have heard of him, Donald Trump, said when he got hundreds of millions of dollars in refunds, he was complying with law. You buying that from uh, Mr. Trump? I don't know. We have no, as you, as you said, we have no way of knowing. And if they were doing anything illegal, 
in not obeying the law of the land in terms of uh, you know what? paying all their taxes, and they should be audited and, and okay. prosecuted. Jamie, Jamie thanks I'm, for I'm, calling. I'm rushing off of this only because this really is a little far afield for what we're talking about here. Well, it's also ridiculous, with all due respect <laughs> to uh, <laughs> Jamie. Uh, I, I mean that in the nicest way, Jamie. I'm just whatever. 877-301-8900. Uh, 70 is the number. Here's a good, if you need a sort of a, a support group, my husband and I were pastors, this is from 1509, serving neighboring churches when our third child was born. After an insane trip with all three to the grocery store, I dreamed up a new support group, the PO'd for parents outnumbered, and one need only have one child to belong. I think it's an excellent idea. People should join. 877-301-897. Listen to this from Betsy. I would get up at the crack of dawn to pack lunches, snacks, fill out permission forms, get sports, get sports equipment ready, make breakfast, make sure school clothes are ready, make sure everyone has their inhalers. By the time I got to work, I'd already done a full day's work and was exhausted. My husband would get up early to watch an hour of TV and spend an hour in the bathroom Facebooking. We are now separated, but somewhere along the line he asked, what happened to us, right. Betsy? Well, I got a good one to it from 7551. When I had my son, the best advice I got was from a coworker. It was this. It's okay to look out the window and think about jumping. Just don't do it. <laughs> that made me feel normal. Ashley, you're in New Hampshire. You're on Boston Public Radio. Thank you for calling. Hi. Hi. Thanks for having me. Thanks uh, for calling. My first time calling. I've listened to you guys a long time. I'm a, I'm a mom of three. Uh -huh. and I was so fortunate to have my third kid six months before the pandemic hit. Oh, God. And um, my job closed a week before shutdown. So I was actually stuck at home with my three children for the first time um, since having them. And I really struggled with learning how to do remote learning, keep the house clean, not run away. And it was, it was a lot. And I have to give my husband credit. He was, he was all hands on deck, but I don't think that we give stay-at-home moms enough credit, and I will say that I ran back to work at the first chance I got, and the biggest challenge was finding childcare because there was no childcare available, especially for the two-year-old. So what'd you do? Um, what'd you do? Well, I cobbled together a system that was a precarious house of cards that was part nanny part um, flexible work schedule with my husband's job, part grandparent, and part two-day-a-week daycare. And honestly, it, it, it didn't work when it was what we had to do, and it was uh, super stressful because if the kid was sick, one of us had to stay home, even if it was just a runny nose because of COVID policy. And um, we were on a waiting list to get into daycare. It was crazy. I don't know how people do it. So how are you doing now? Sort of. The, hopefully, we're coming out of the other end. How are you holding up? Um, you know, I'm, I work. I work in Boston. I live in New Hampshire. I have a four-hour long commute round oh, trip. Oh God! I like a ten to eleven-hour workday and three children. So I've been better. <laughs> um, but, you know. But Ashley, before you go, in a moment of seriousness, I, while Marjorie and I both ugged when you said a four-hour commute. Is the four-hour commute, in, on some days at least, not a, a respite that you feel you actually was welcomed? Oh, I get to listen to you guys. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's horrible. I, I moved here from Los Angeles, so yeah. I thought I was used to it, but I think you guys win. <laughs> Ashley, you're a good one. Thank you. Uh, glad you made your first call. We really, we really appreciate it. 877-301-8970. By the way, we, yesterday we were talking about, or yesterday, 10 minutes ago, we were talking about are people going to rise up on the abortion front? And a someone from an organization called Boston Red Cloaks wants us to know they're going to be walking slowly and solemnly from the make way for ducklings in, uh, obviously, in the common, the great Nancy Shearn sculptures, to the State House for 2 p.m. speakers. Join us if you're ready to fight for abortion rights. So I would say you could listen to the show, be at the show, and then join them at the State House if you so choose. 877 is the We're number. Brian from, Brian from East Boston, thank you for calling. Hey, Brian. Hey, how you doing? Good. Um, yeah, I'm ju I just wanted to comment on the fact that I, I, I literally, I've had some terrible roommates when I was in college, but the two children, four and seven, that are in our house are the hardest roommates <laughs> that I've had to live with. Why is that? 
And not only that, they're they're not paying their bills, they're not paying the rent. <laughs> you give them anything to eat, and it's all over the floor, and they don't clean up after themselves. Yeah. yeah. And it takes them so much time just to get their shoes on to get out of the house. So, but I've had some terrible, obnoxious roommates, but these are these are definitely. Well, you just have to choose um, your roommates they're, more they're carefully next more time, Brian. That's the bottom line. <laughs> Brian, thanks That's for your right. call. We appreciate you your know, contribution. You know, it's so funny. I'm surrounded by people with young kids, people downstairs from me. Their kids are a little bit older now. But, you know, so many times I hear them in the morning, and mom's out there saying, get in the car, get in the car, <laughs> get in the car, 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 like 20 times before the kids finally get in the car. And the guy across the street from me has got like a, a two-year-old and an infant, and every morning he's trying to carry the two-year-old out to get in the car to go to the daycare. Under wherever his they're arm? Going. Under his arm, That's with the kids great. kicking and screaming and carrying on. That's pretty great. Yeah, I know. It, and, it, of course, it's... it's many people have pointed out it never ends because you think you're going to get rid of them when they go off and they become adults and sometimes they refuse to leave jim hey by the way you know we should say as an antidote to this doesn't fix everything it's a small touch a little later in the show we're going to take your calls on what you can do for your mother on That's sunday right. on mother's day but up next we're going to talk to suffolk county da kevin hayden about his expansion of services over sentencing programs at massachusetts avenue and melanie cass boulevard and also these attacks by some very young kids uh, against uh, people on Boston Common and Downtown Crossing. You are listening to Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GBH. We're broadcasting live as we do every Tuesday and Friday from the Boston Public Library. Massachusetts, we like to think we do politics better than other places, but have we really lived up to that ideal? I'm Adam Riley. Tonight on Talking Politics, we speak with the editors of a new book that asks whether Massachusetts exceptionalism is real or bogus. Plus, AG candidate Quentin Pelfrey joins us to talk about his candidacy and his push to keep outside money out of that race. Talking Politics, tonight at 7 on GBH2 and online at gbhnews.org. Support for GBH comes from you. And Speakeasy Stage, presenting The Inheritance, Matthew Lopez's Tony Award-winning play, which chronicles the lives of three generations of gay men in a changing America, now playing. More at speakeasystage.com. And safety insurance. Cyber attacks aren't going away. You can talk to an independent agent about cyber coverage from Safety Insurance. Safety Insurance. They'll help you manage life's storms, even the cyber kind. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Browdy and Marjorie, and we're live at the Boston Public Library. You can watch us streaming on YouTube as well, youtube.com slash GBH News. Earlier this week, interim Suffolk County DA Kevin Hayden announced plans for an expansion of the Service Over Sentences program for people arrested around Mass and Cass. The program seeks to point people with substance abuse issues and mental illness towards treatment in hopes they can circumvent jail time that could just make their problems worse. The DA will explain it better. He joins us now. By the way, as you know, the DA is running for re-election. Uh, challenging him is Ricardo Arroyo. He will be joining us on May 20th. DA Hayden, it's great to see you. Thanks so much for being here. Good to see you again. Thank you. Hey, Pleasure. Thank you very much, District Attorney, for, for, for coming in. So let's start with this story about this um, this Mission Hill K-8 through school where there was a, a, apparently years of of kids sexually abusing each other and bullying and stuff that went on for quite some time. The school's going to close now, I guess. But what, see, what I'm wondering about it is, is um, how do we know that this is unusual if it's gone on there for years and nobody seemed to know about it? And what is going to happen, if anything, criminally with anybody involved up there? Sure. Well, first of all, obviously, I, I think the entire situation is horribly tragic. Um, to discover and learn that these sorts of things have been going on for so long um, and apparently not um, maybe revealed or known at the level that they should have been. So um, we are uh, reviewing the report um, and looking uh, into what, if anything, we'll do. Uh, our primary concern is whether or not there was uh, mandatory reporting requirements that weren't followed appropriately. So yeah. as, of, as far as you know at the moment, as you're investigating that, I guess we're led to believe no one ever reached out 
to the police. No one ever reached out to the Suffolk County DA's office. You've only been there a few months, but I mean, based on your research, there was nobody reached out to anybody except officials in the school itself? As far as I know, no. The first I learned of it was when it, it would, became known in the media. You know, I want to follow up on Marjorie's question. We asked the same question of Mayor Wu about this when she was with us the other day. This is what troubles me most. Obviously, we're deeply troubled by what we know or believe happened at Mission Hill, is if the Suffolk County DA and the Boston police knew nothing about what was going on within the school, and let's ex assume that's true for the moment, then how do we know that there's not another Mission Hill at another school where things are being covered up in-house, where kids are being abused in one fashion or another? And what do you do to try to uh, assure that that isn't happening going forward? We don't know, do we? I think that's a question that you have asked the Boston Public School Department. So what do you do? But what do you do about it? I mean, I assume the fact to me, when I read the story, and I read that some parents, uh, district attorney, were complaining to the school and didn't understand, care, uh, uh, get the fact that if you're, not only if you're not getting satisfaction, if you are getting satisfaction, if a crime has been perpetrated against your child, then the person to talk to is the cop or the DA. I mean, there's an education gap there, clearly, no, that you should be filling. Am I not right about that? No, I wouldn't disagree with that. That's exactly what they should be doing. Any parent that is concerned about uh, crimes being committed or perpetrated against their, their children should be reporting that to the police and or our office. So is there some program that either the new superintendent, we don't know who he or she is yet, the superintendent's office, you, are planning to do to educate parents? Yeah, about we'd be, be happy to engage in that. And we, we do some probing around that, like now you see and things like that, that inform people about what their rights are and what the, what's available to them. So, And there may be prosecutions here. Last question about Mission Hill. There may be, you're looking into whether or not there are crimes that merit prosecution, correct? We are, but we, I, I, I caution, we're not, we're not in an investigation stage. We're reviewing the report. Okay, fair enough. Talking to DA Kevin Hayden. <coughs> So there's been a lot of uh, uh, media coverage of these uh, young kids going after people in Downtown Crossing and Boston Common. We have Michelle Wu was, uh, was on WBZ TV last week talking about this group of kids that were kind of running around not behaving themselves. Here she is. These are children who need support and services and they're connected to adults who also need to have some accountability. We're looking to make sure that when we do know about um, specific identities and people, that there's a very closely targeted intervention to provide those supports. So what's happening uh, with these uh, kids involved in this? Well, first of all, running around and not behaving themselves would be an understatement. Yeah, <laughs> that is true. <laughs> this is a... Um, a series of violent attacks that have been going on for a long period of time since the middle of March, along with other serious crimes that, um, that these young children have been committing. Um, so uh, we do have uh, two juveniles that are of age who have been arrested and charged in a series of attacks and other incidents. Um, and there is also, a, a, anyone who's read the media has heard, I think there's an 11 year old that's involved yes, as well. Yes, a girl. And um, that is uh, beyond our purview uh, per, the new, per the law, the change in the law. Um, and so uh, it's my understanding that uh, the, the department of, uh, that DCF has become involved and substantially involved, but I don't know much more than that. And for kids that are older, like th the 13 year olds, what are the options for services for them? Any time a juvenile is arrested, it's always tragic, it's always heartbreaking, it's always difficult to deal with. We never want to see it, right? Um, our first response is always intervention and services and prevention uh, for kids that are brought into, our, into the system. Um, and in this particular cir circumstance, uh, had that happened at the outset, that's exactly what we would have been looking at. Unfortunately, in this circumstance, uh, things got out of control. Uh, it got to the point where we were looking at a series of violent attacks, uh, and we were faced with a unfortunate and extreme measures of having to actually arraign and charge these individuals. Can you, you know, confidently say, I mean, uh, one of these attacks at least was a, what, a Suffolk, count, a Suffolk law student, I think it was, getting punched in the face or in the, on the common. Am by I, the 11-year-old. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, how do you assure, are you and the police able to assure 
someone on a nice day like yesterday or maybe even today that wants to walk through the common that they're safe and that that's not going to happen to them? Well, we can never ensure that absolutely, obviously. I, I will tell you that since, uh, uh, since we've gotten some control over this situation that the uh, violent incidences in downtown Boston area have gone way down. Meaning it was pretty much the same set of kids doing this over and same over? Same set of kids. Yeah. It's been, it's been two violent incidents in the last seven days, I think, as opposed to prior to that, it was a daily occurrence, sometimes multiple times a day. You know, I, I was a reporter for a long time for the Boston Herald and covered a lot of crime stories. And I always m remember thinking lots of times you'd get to the house where there were kids that were involved in some kind of trouble. Maybe they were a little bit older. Um, you, you weren't in the house for too long or you didn't talk to mom for too long or maybe dad if he was around or to realize that there was a huge problem in, in this house and thinking, wouldn't it be wonderful if there were some opportunities for whole families? You know, it, we don't do enough for people that are living with very difficult either mental health issues or substance abuse issues or poverty issues. You know, like this violence of these kids doesn't come out of nowhere. No. These, these children are, are dealing with, in all likelihood, very deep-seated trauma um, that is, has been, been pro probably prevalent from the very beginning of their life. Um, that holistic approach to intervention and prevention and treatment for the entire family and to address um, the entire cycle that um, is going on is an approach that was used before, back when I was in the district attorney's office many years ago. Um, I don't know if it's not being used now. Um, it's, it's expensive. It, 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 it is expensive, but it's also necessary. You have, you have uh, an entire family that needs support, that needs services, that needs access to um, the opportunities that can hopefully prevent these sorts of things from happening. Absolutely. Do you think the services are there? I mean, Marjorie goes out of her way, I have to say, almost every opportunity to talk about the commitment and quality of work of social workers who are underpaid, undervalued, all that sort of with DCF <laughs> and that. But are, are the resources, I mean, you've been in and around the system as the DA, the sex offender registry you ran, and here now, are the resources there to match the rhetoric? I think they are. I think that, that the uh, people that need the services, though, ultimately at some level have to want it. Uh, they have to be willing to come to the table. Well, you know, that's a perfect segue to they have to want it, they have to come to the table, they need intervention. Almost the exact same words that you and Mayor Wu used around these kids appear to be what at least the policy is including in your office around this sort of reemergence, for lack of a better expression, of mass and cask. Before you tell us what you're doing there, could you tell us, almost, I assume everybody listening, either here at the library or at home or at work or in their car, knows what happened when Mastencast was shut down and what the efforts were on Mayor Wu's behalf to find places for them. Where are we in early May of 2022 at Mastencast before you tell us about some of the crimes you're trying to deal with? Sure, I think where we are in terms of where we could be, I don't think we know yet. I think that the, um, the, the mayor uh, and the Boston police, um, my office, everyone has done, Boston Public Health Commission done an extraordinary job of trying to lay a hold of that problem. Um, I, I just actually just drove by there earlier today, uh, and I think that everyone shares the concern that are we, with the weather returning and sun coming back, are we going to return to an, an explosion of the problem that we saw before? It's, I think it's too early to tell. Um, what we have determined to do is uh, dedicate um, $400,000 in resources in conjunction um, with the Sentencing Over Services Organization in order to provide um, treatment alternatives for people down there um, who need it and who want it. And we're focusing on the uh, both hi the highest risk and the highest need people that are down there. When you said sentencing over services, you meant services over sentencing. A second <laughs> I, ago, I, I just want to, so that people don't think you're... I did. So, <laughs> and this is, just to understand, what does that mean in English? I mean, I, I assume this is non-violent offenses. Is that, am I right about that? Those who have this diversionary sort of care and what's available to that person? Uh, what's available to that person? Sure, so it's through North Shore Mental Health. Um, and there are, we are going to have uh, both uh, service providers and a coordinator that are going to be working with people that come into the system. They can voluntarily uh, uh, place themselves into uh, treatment programs to hopefully deal with their addiction problems or mental health issues. Qu quite frankly, they go hand in hand almost all the time, right? 
Um, and in so doing, uh, be diverted from prosecution, be diverted from sentencing, um, and hopefully get the treatment they need. Hopefully understand what brought them to that location in the first place and hopefully help them to understand why it would be best and most healthy for them not to return. And if they volu don't voluntarily select that option, they're prosecuted. Is that, w is that what you do? Is that it, it depends. I mean, there are still sort of situations where we, where we might divert the case. But if, it, it, if a high-risk, high-need individual is arraigned and chooses not to avail themselves of the services, yes, they'd be prosecuted. You, know, you were not uh, the DA. Uh, I assume everybody knows you became the DA. You were appointed by the governor after Rachel Rollins was elevated to the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office. You were not there when Sheriff Tompkins uh, made the offer of some of his facilities right down there that I think was respectfully responded to by most public officials but never embraced. And the primary argument against it, and please correct me if you think I'm misstating it, was a jail is still a jail no matter how you design it, no matter what it looks like, no matter how inviting you hope it to be. What's your position on whether or not uh, 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 you, others, should avail themselves of Sheriff Tompkins' offer. I applaud Sheriff Tompkins for the, the, the willingness and the boldness to um, suggest such an approach. Um, and I think it's something that is still there. It's still an option and it should still be reconsidered. We have to consider every option and every lever and every mechanism and every avenue of treatment and resources to deal with mass and caste. Well, you, you know, know what I thought when, when Sheriff Tompkins was taking so much criticism? People that want to get three months, 90 days of inpatient substance abuse uh, help or inpatient mental health help can't get it for the, for the most part. If they're, forget if they're at mass and gas, if they're just living in, you know, Wellesley or something. And I did think that was kind of, uh, that was sort of shunted aside. Three months of of help is a big deal, but, but everybody seemed to be against the idea because of the jail part. Three months of help versus uh, a week or two weeks yeah. of help is a big difference. And um, I fear that maybe uh, some place too much emphasis on the fact that it was the jail. At the end of the day, it was a building, just like this is a building. Um, and. I fear that the, the, the definition of that building um, might have curtailed a really good opportunity. Yeah. So you it's think it should get a more serious look, you seem to be saying? I don't see why not. Uh -huh. I, I, I because again, I, I, you can't afford it. You know, the, your insurance won't cover you for a certain level or there's yeah. not enough beds where you're waiting, you know, you're ready to go into treatment today, but they tell you, well, we can't give you treatment until Friday, and Friday comes, you don't want to mm -hmm. go into treatment anymore. It's a big problem. Those beds um, and that building is still there. There's no reason not to try yeah. it. We tried um, a, another building down there um, that just got shut down because there's too much violence going on there. It tried. It's been shut down for now. It might be reopened, but I think we need to try everything. We're talking to Suffolk County District Attorney Kevin Hayden. Um, so the something called the Youth Violence Strike Force um, arrested a Brockton man uh, in Rosendale who had a loaded firearm, which was later described as a ghost gun. So two questions, uh, District Attorney. Tell us what the Youth Violence Strike Force is and what a ghost gun is. So the Youth Violence Strike Force is just a division within, the, within the Boston Police Department that is dealing with um, uh, people that are associated with gangs and, and high-level at-risk youth um, and or adults, young adults that are in, um, involved in criminality. So that's what the Youth Violence Strike Force is. Ghost guns um, is a very complicated um, issue. Um, it's not necessarily people hear about the 3D printer and they go, oh, this gun is just made on 3D printer. That's right. not really how it works. So most of the gun is provided through um, alternative sources. It's sent to you. You go somewhere. You buy it. It's a kit. And then there's instructions to use your 3D printer to, pr to create various pieces that then go together with whatever you've bought that makes the gun. That's with really no what ID. The, that's really what it goes against. Kind of no ID, no way of tracing it, no serial numbers, no nothing. Dangerous because those p pieces are plastic. Dangerous because those pieces erode over time. Dangerous because um, they're not the greatest guns to begin with, and they can also eventually pose a risk to you as well when you're firing it, if not used appropriately. You know, I noticed in the story talking about the arrest of this man with the ghost gun that there were three men in the car when the officers approached them, and the officers recognized the three men as people who already had firearms cases pending, 
and one of them was wearing a GPS ankle bracelet. So it did seem as though the ankle bracelet and the <laughs> pending cases did not deter their enthusiasm to be out on the street armed. No, it didn't. We've had similar incidents the way with the shooting in um, uh, Chinatown was similar. People already had the, the prior history. You know, uh, we're talking to interim district. Interim is the right word? Is that what you are? The interim? Is that what I'm the, the district the attorney. Okay, the fine. That the governor we're talking to the district <laughs> attorney of Suffolk <laughs> County who's running for re-election uh, in the uh, full. Kevin Hayden. You know, I want to spend the last few minutes on a case that has really put me and I assume everybody over the age. Patrick Rose uh, pled guilty to essentially being a serial sexual abuser. Uh, he was uh, credibly believed by the police themselves 20 plus years ago to have sexually abused a kid. Uh, they let him stay on the force for a mere 20 years, ultimately became the head of the Patrolman's Association Union. And because he was allowed to stay on the force, uh, correct me if I'm wrong at any point, that essentially enabled him to become a serial abuser as opposed to one-time abuser. To your credit, the victims, the survivors were spared from having testified by the guilty pleas you negotiated with him. However, here's the big however. We discussed this with Mayor Wu last week. There was a cover-up in the police department. There was be decisions made by people in the police department leadership that allowed Patrick Rose, the serial child abuser, to continue to have access to kids as a cop in the city for two decades. The fear I, and I hope every fair-minded person has, is that with this guilty plea, and by the way, making it sound like I'm criticizing you, I'm not at all, I think it's good you got a guilty plea, that there is no vehicle for ever opening this case. Uh, uh, mayor Walsh would not disclose any of his internal file. Uh, interim Mayor uh, Janey disclosed, I think, 13 of more than 100 pages. We asked Mayor Wood the other day, she said she'd speak to her people at the police oversight thing. Where are you on whether or not the public has a right and is right to demand that public officials let us know who knew what when and who did what, what to enable this guy to be the worst kind of criminal? Sure. I, you know, I was at that plea um, and uh, it was also uh, with uh, one of the survivors mm -hmm. uh, a week later at a ceremony in our office where uh, survivors were honored uh, for their bravery uh, and for their fortitude and for what it takes to get through mm -hmm. these sorts of cases. They are always uh, tragic. That one in particular was absolutely heartbreaking. I will be frank in saying to you that I don't know that much about the circumstances in terms of what was or wasn't provided or what that cover-up was, if any. Um, but it's certainly something I'd be willing to look at. Shouldn't these I mean? It is not credible, we only have a minute left in my estimation, with all due respect to Mayor Janey, that 80 plus pages had to be redacted to protect the identity of the survivors. Of course you protect their identity, but five-sixths of the document not available to the public? Don't you think it's important that we, the public, know who is responsible for enabling this guy for two decades? From my standpoint, without seeing those documents, knowing what was redacted and why it was redacted, and not knowing what the issues were surrounding the victims, I really I don't know. I just don't know that much about it. I apologize. Well, I, you know, I would ask is it respectfully, before you're back next time, I would hope you'd take a look at this, because I don't think I'm speaking for just me. I think no, I'm it's, speaking it's for terrible. a lot of people. It, it, it's terrible. This guy was accused in 1995. Yep, he, 95. He resigned in 2018, and the negligence enabled him to abuse other children. That's the tragedy. Sure. It's kind of like the Catholic Church kind of thing. We only have I 10 anyway. seconds. Are you having any fun in this job, or is this like <laughs> a nightmare? I'm, I'm, no. I'm loving every minute you of it. You are? I was built for this. There you, know? you go. I was built for this. I had 25 years of experience, prosecutor, criminal defense attorney, nine years of the sex offender registry board. Um, That's fun, too, the sex yeah. offender registry <laughs> board. I, yeah, that was real fun. <laughs> no, I, I honestly believe um, I was called for such a time as this. I'm built for it. I'm loving every minute of it. We're glad to see you. We hope to see you again soon. Kevin Hayden, thanks so much. That is so Kevin much. Hayden, Thank the you. district attorney of Suffolk County. is running for elected full term, and we've got his opponent, Ricardo Arroyo, who will be joining us later this month. Up next, we're going to talk to GBH's Callie Crossley about the bill to allow undocumented residents of Massachusetts to get driver's licenses and about Kareem G. Pierre, the first black openly gay U.S. press secretary following the exit of, John, of Jen Psaki. That's, of course, Biden's press secretary. Callie Crossley, up next, you're listening to 89.7 GBH, Boston Public Radio, live from the Boston Public Library.
I'm Frank Oglesby, voice of the T. The doors are opening for smart conversation with Jim Browdy and Marjorie Egan on Boston Public Radio. Local perspective, local voices. Welcome aboard Boston's local NPR. Funding for our programs comes from you and the Boston Pops. This spring at Symphony Hall, you can enjoy film nights, Broadway stars, a gospel performance, and a celebration of the musical legacy of Duke Ellington and Billy Strayhorn. Tickets at bostonpops.org. Follow a robotics team as it unites a town and teaches its young residents that they can overcome obstacles and chase their dreams. Don't miss Big Dreams in Umatilla, Saturday at 6 on GBH 44. Trusted. Local. News. This is 89.7 WGBH. WGBH HD1 Boston. Online at gbhnews.org. Boston's local NPR. Ahead on Boston Public Radio, journalist and naturalist Cy Montgomery joins us at the library to discuss her new book, The Hawk's Way, Encounters with Fierce Beauty. Then former Chief Justice of the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court, Margaret Marshall, who wrote America's first decision embracing same-sex marriage, joins us to reflect on the impending end of Roe v. Wade and what it might mean same-sex marriage. We'll fill our Boston Public Library studio with an amazing musical concert. The Metropolitan Chorale of Brookline joins us with a preview of Duke Ellington's sacred concert. All that and more ahead, Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GBH. Live from NPR News in Washington, I'm Lakshmi Singh. The United Nations says it is evacuating Ukrainian civilians from a massive steel plant in the besieged port city of Mariupol. NPR's Joanna Kakissis reports from southern Ukraine that the civilians are sheltering in tunnels underneath the plant along with hundreds of Ukrainian soldiers. The massive steel plant is the last Ukrainian holdout in Mariupol, which Russia claims it has occupied. Russian bombing and shelling have Russian troops have reportedly pushed into the steelworks tunnel to attack Ukrainian soldiers there. They are the source of heavy, bloody fighting. <laughs> the wives and partners of Ukrainian soldiers fighting in Azovstal are pleading with the UN to also evacuate the fighters. They are staging protests in the city of Zaporizhia, where Azovstal evacuees are taken. Joanna Kakisis, NPR News, Zaporizhia, Ukraine. In the United States, according to the Bureau of Narcotics Report, at least 10 people were killed in the raid on the Capitol on Wednesday. With the U.S. Supreme Court in eight justice appointments to decide, young women and adults who are illegally in the world face pathways to prison that may include days in jail for possession of controlled substances or illegal abortion. Those who get abortions in the country are also among the most disadvantaged, young and poor people, and racial minorities. Poor access to sex education, insurance, health care, and contraception contribute to disproportionately higher rates. According to the most recent data, black and Latino women receive more than half of all abortions. Rarely abortions are performed on white or Hispanic men. The same people in those populations are also likeliest to lose access to abortion, between the first black man and trans. That would also trigger state abortions for people aged as high as about 26 years old and some of these people can't get an abortion. Higher human rights are taken in Guam and Minnesota as new reports of rapists facing unusual court cases. Guam is about to meet one of them. Government officials say the story is not yet official. The Fox Riot. Two assassination fighters were killed on Wednesday. Rising bar at the Fox is the place where killings are most common on Fridays. The average hourly wage is most over a five and a half percent from hour ago. And certain those wage gains will pervert the expected increase of potential for concern for the pair. The state has ruled that employers may try to offset the cost of higher wages by raising prices on top of most inflation, which is already rising four decades ago, even more. NPR's Scott Horton is at Bay Area Women's Star Rock in Palm Beach this week to learn more about why the women's march is being canceled. More than 200 people were killed in the riot on Wednesday. Horton, NPR News. 
Good afternoon from the GBH Radio Newsroom in Boston. I'm Henry Santoro. After a week away from school for April vacation, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education has released new COVID in the classroom numbers yesterday as they show more than 10,000 positive cases. Over 8,000 students have the virus and over 2,000 staff members tested positive this week. Now, health officials say that's double the average of the past two weeks, but, and it's a pretty big but, those weeks did not include the fact that it was a staff only vacation. Jesse officials say the highest number of cases are in Boston Public Schools, followed by Newton, Pittsfield, Worcester, Springfield, and Craven Lake. And the clouds are showing up just in time for the weekend. Boo, temperatures will drop back to the mid 50s today with a chance of scattered showers, then rain will linger all weekend, and the, car and the thermometer won't move that much either. Tony Gosher with the National Weather Service says that weather might start to clear on Mother's Day. The day will trend drier as we head into the afternoon. Uh, Sunday afternoon, though, temperatures are still uh, a bit on the cooler side, slightly below average for uh, early May, with high temperatures about in the low to middle part of the 50s. And if you're playing the long game right now, the forecast shows that we could see 80 degrees by the end of next week. Everybody is gaming now. In sports, the Brewers are hoping for a win tonight against the Hurricanes. The Bees are down two games to none in the playoffs, and the Red Sox open a weekend series with the Chicago White Sox at Fenway tonight. First pitch, 7-10. Boy, would it be nice to win a series. Support for NPR comes from NPR stations. Other contributors include Angie, formerly Angie's List, dedicated to helping homeowners tackle home projects from everyday repairs to dream remodels. Reviews, pricing, and booking are at Angie.com or on the Angie app. I'm Henry Santoro. This is GBH News. Eastern Browdy, I am Marjorie Egan. You are listening to our number two of Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GBH. We are broadcasting live as we do every Tuesday and Friday from the Boston Public Library. I want to say one thing. I was going to tell you that we're streaming on YouTube, but I'm not. Because if you choose YouTube, instead of getting down here as quickly <laughs> as you can, <laughs> during the lunch break, we had the Metropolitan yeah. Corral and Gabrielle Goodman, their soloist, and this incredible tap dancer rehearse for a couple of minutes. I am telling you, mm. if you want a great lift on a Friday of a very bad news week, yeah. I would suggest you get down here 1.30 at latest for a spectacular half hour. Not that you're not going to be good, Callie. I'm sure <laughs> you're going to be uplifting, too. I'm so uh, uplifting. Let me tell you, she is. In any case, uh, we're joined now by that very Callie, GBH's Callie Crossley, here with reflections on a post-Row America and so much more. Callie, of course, is the host of Under the Radar with Callie Crossley, which you can catch Sunday nights right here on 89.7 at 6. She's also the host of Basic Black, which airs Friday which is tonight at 7.30 on GBH2. Callie, it's great to see you. Thanks so much for being here. Great to see you, Jim well, and Marjorie. Yeah, oh, thank, thank you, you very much, Callie. So, uh, Callie, y you, like me, you were a young woman when Roe v. Wade went I'm through the I'm still a young Supreme woman. Court. I don't know what <laughs> you're okay. saying. All right. <laughs> we're still young women. S 1973, I was anxious to get your reaction to uh, this leak uh, from Alito about the plans that the Supreme Court apparently has at this moment to overturn Roe. Well, I should begin by saying that this is uh, the subject of my commentary on Monday, so they're about full of reaction. But um, first of all, I don't believe that's the draft. I think that's it. <laughs> um, yeah. And um, I would be surprised if there was even any minimal change to it. So having said that, I think it's been interesting watching a lot of very young women freak out, like they've never lived at a time where they had to think about this. Um, here are some statistics that just, you know, give me pause. One in every four women have had an abortion. Their age is 15 to 44, and half of them are black and Latino. And so we're about to see some uh, closing off of access and people forced underground. Now, underground is going to look different than it did back in the day when people were literally going to back alleys, but it's still going to go underground, and you'll still end up with uh, folks that perhaps don't have um, medical expertise to be helping you. Um, I think the other thing that is interesting to note that I didn't know until this came up is that half of the abortions, of the, the ones that we just said one in four women are getting, are medical abortions. And now they're trying to shut that down in various states. 
which, you know, if, if, if the, the whole principle of this was founded on privacy. You just can't get any more private than reaching into people's homes and mailboxes and all of that. Um, having said all that, I have been impressed in an interesting way by listening to uh, some of the people on the um, anti-choice side who are so delighted that this is happening. And two uh, comments stand out to me. One by a woman, she was just so happy. She said, this is gonna, I, I'm, I'm happy, I'm waiting to welcome the babies um, by these women who didn't really know that they wanted to have them. Uh, the level of naivete about the circumstances of these women is shocking, shocking. to me. Shocking. And then to this morning I heard on NPR a man say, I've been praying for this and praying for this, and, um, and so the reporter said, you know, with respect, what do you say to uh, about these women? What's going to happen with these children that are born from a situation where women had no choice? And he said, I believe that, you know, someone will step up and provide. See, it can't be someone. I have deep respect for a woman uh, whose name, I'm sorry, I can't remember, uh, years ago who was virulently anti-choice. And she set up a system to gather up these children that were not going to be taken care of. I'm not talking about adoption agencies. I believe that that's high end. I think there's all kinds of kids that are going to be born that no one will take care of. We've seen the result of that as it is. Yeah. Um, and it's going to be horrific. And then meanwhile, all these people that are saying this, they're not yelling at their representatives to support child care, the extension of the this you know the child care extension act any of the stuff that would provide for the children that you so desperately or believe need to be here or you know. strengthen legislation to Thank go after you. deadbeat fathers right. who don't give a dime to the support of the of the children and the women that they had created these children with you know i used to think that you know i've heard many many people say you know it comes down to people just hate women i used to think well that's kind of an extreme expression I am now thinking, looking at this legislation which provides no exemption for women of um, rape and incest, you fundamentally have no idea what that emotional and physical impact of that woman would be. You know, none. Nor are you aware of the circumstances of women who, with no choice, have these children and they end up in the, the, the pit of poverty and then you complain about now they're dragging on all our resources because they want to have some women and children, um, you know, support from the government. I mean, this is ridiculous. Pick one and support it all the way through. Yeah. You who, know? Was the, who was the guest we had on the other day, Marjorie, or was it you that talked about how uh, Gorsuch, Alito, Kavanaugh, live in a Thomas, and, uh, and Coney I Barrett live in a bubble. I think it was Chuck Todd. It was Chuck Todd yeah. from Meet the Press. And, and, right. and, you know, if you didn't doubt that. They don't that, know what life is like. If you right. didn't doubt that. Right. Well, it, it, to be sort of just unfeeling, I mean, and I've, I'll repeat this again, but it so stunned me that Amy Coney Barrett, who is the mother of seven children, had no conception about how difficult it is to give up a child for adoption, like it was a cavalier thing. So I'll carry this baby for nine months and then I'll give it up for adoption, like it was no big deal. That's what she said at her hearing. That's yeah. what she yeah. said at her hearing. And I hearing. thought, how could you be lack basic empathy or not understand as someone who's given birth five times? She adopted two of her own children, who's given birth five times. You have no understanding? I mean, it's and like more to the point, as a person who's adopted, you understand, you know, how much it costs, how much the support is, all the regulations, all of that. It's not something that people just, you know, wander into easily. Mm -mm. I mean, it's it's just shocking to me on so many levels. And the, and the low-income women and the the women of color who are caught in in this. Well, it's mostly thing. poor women that do have abortions, right. and most of them are mothers. Right. So they know exactly what it means to not be able to feed the two kids you already have, or care for the two kids you already have, or get a job with the two kids you already have. And now you find yourself, because birth control does fail, right. uh, pregnant yet again, and no, you cannot take care of a third child. And I want to be clear, so I'm not misunderstood. Um, I am not mocking anybody's faith. You know, because I am a faithful person. But you know, God helps those who help themselves. You need to provide some support for backing up, you know, what you believe. So, sir, you can't say somebody, somebody somewhere is going to take care of it. Now, what are you doing if you believe this is, you know, what needs to well, happen? Well, it's also important to, to say that Catholicism, which is often, and we have six yes. Catholic justices, was okay with getting rid of pregnancies mm -hmm. up until the so-called quickening, yeah. right through 1859, yeah. when they changed their mind. And the Southern Baptists 
were okay yeah. with abortion right through the 1970s. They, they changed their mind after integration, right? right? Because they figured, oh, talking about unborn babies yeah. would get them more support than talking about let's put, have these poor little black kids stay in their, their segregated schools. I mean, it was politics, not some deep-seated faith that caused the Southern Baptist Convention to change. So to me, there are some people of faith who sincerely are, Absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. they're all about the unborn, but I don't think that's the majority, and I no. certainly don't think that's the political motivation here at I'm all. I'm sorry to say I don't think so either, and it's it's really it's it's sad, and it's and it's um, these are real women's lives that are caught in the middle of this. So I don't know. I mean, I am I am distraught. I'm interested to see what y these young young women are doing. I'm watching all these movements of quote unquote underground stuff going on that's overground that are preparing um, to help women who are going to be. Um, trapped without access and Massachusetts because we live here is going to be you know one of the points where women are coming well depending know? let's you be know? clear in the <coughs> interim they'll be where women are coming but if you talk to Carol Rose who we did the other yes. day the head of civil liberties union former uh, federal judge Nancy Gertner we spoke to the other day if a Republican Congress which it's likely yeah. to be unless people rise up as a result of mm -hmm. this and the insurrection and other things and a Republican president in 2025 decide to equate uh, right. uh, a um, fetus with personhood, uh, they believe there's at least a decent chance even the protections in a state like Massachusetts fall to the federal decision. So we shall see. You yeah. know, we're gonna, we decided when we were thinking about you today, we we're only gonna do one more horrible story and then okay. we're gonna talk about some upbeat things. Uh -huh. uh, I wanna play for you, I, I thought a beautiful moment from Joe Biden. This is on the eve of his inauguration. And at that time, 400,000 people in this country mm. had died from COVID. This was the ceremony, I assume you all saw it, I hope you mm -hmm. saw it, at the Lincoln Memorial Reflecting Pool. This was obviously in January of 2021. Here's Biden. To heal, we must remember. It's hard sometimes to remember, but that's how we heal. It's important to do that as a nation. That's why we're here today. Between sundown and dusk, let us shine the lights in the darkness along the sacred pool of reflection and remember all whom we lost. Well, we haven't remembered all we've lost. We have not uh, uh, done this as a nation. It was 400,000 then, it's a million in the next few days. And I was struck by the fact, despite the incredible pain this has caused millions of families, thanks to the work of people like Alex Goldstein with uh, Faces of COVID, the brilliant uh, a Twitter page that celebrates the lives of many people who were lost, but obviously can't cover them all. It's almost like this is a temporary blip yeah. on the screen. And, and we have Dr. Fauci with us, talk about perfect timing mm -hmm. on Monday. Are you amazed how little yeah. acknowledgement of this unimaginable pain this country has given since Biden gave that speech? I am amazed, I'm constantly amazed. It, it, I think it feels like for a lot of people an out of body experience and it's one that they just have disconnected from. I mean, there are so many scenarios that, that just keep me focused on how horrific it is, but the one that comes to mind is a dear, dear friend of mine whose mom got COVID and you know, they, you know, caring for her, whatever, she dies. They're go in the middle of COVID, so they're having to do the only two people can come to the service, you know, all the horrible mm -hmm. stuff that you had to do. Goes through all of that, horrible enough. You've lost your mother, this was not supposed to happen, all this happened. And two weeks later, her father gets it, and oh. then he dies. Oh. I just have no words. I sent her a note at the two year anniversary of this and said, you know, there's, you know, this will never be over for you. And, you know, there are many, many more examples of that, but it's just, it just stays with me. I mean, this is real. I am shocked by the number of people who are still in hospitals. I've seen the documentaries and the reports who are there about to take their last breath where nurses are, and doctors are working around the clock for them and then say, while in that circumstance, I will not take the vaccine. And by the way, we should yeah. add a million people have died. Well, by the way, at least a million and a quarter people have died, obviously a million are the reported cases, and Congress can't pass a bill to, to fund yes. whatever is needed now and the beginning of prevention for what is inevitably to come next. In any case, we're gonna move to a positive yeah. thing. Here's a little sound.
from the state Senate <coughs> yesterday. This is as the Senate, by a uh, veto-proof majority, passed a bill uh, granting driver's licenses under the certain limited conditions to people who are here undocumented. Here's the announcement. 32 members having voted in the affirmative, eight in the negative, the bill is passed to be enjoyed. And it also passed, it also passed in the House by veto-proof majority. So even though the governor told us uh, several weeks ago and said repeated again yesterday, he wasn't convinced there was enough protection against this being a vehicle to allow them to register to vote, which mm -hmm. I don't believe it is. Mm -hmm. And the sponsors don't believe it is. Apparently he's going to veto it and the veto will be overridden. But I have one question on this. Advocates for choice, including Marjorie and me, went out of our way to cite the polling that shows that 69% of Americans mm. uh, didn't want this to happen, that the Supreme Court is yet again out of step with the typical American. I'm sure you saw the poll this week. Yeah. Massachusetts is split down the middle, right. 46 in favor of granting these licenses, 47 against. So how do you respond? Uh, to, if we were taking calls today, someone would call, and mm -hmm. I, I yeah. respect that call, saying, well, you're trumpeting. The Supreme Court should do what the people want. The people of Massachusetts don't want this, mm -hmm. at least the majority. How do you respond to that point of view? Well, if people are aware of, of what the, the bill actually says, it's, it's really foundational for a lot of people here who are done undocumented who are working, okay? So if people may know the statistics about the undocumented and the immigrants who are holding up our economy. It's a lot of people. That's, mm -hmm. that's so we're all resting on the economy that these people are working for. And so the question is, do you want them to get to the job or not? I mean, that's really what- And that you're benefiting you know, from their work. It, this is exactly what, you know, a big basis of this bill was all about, is that they're trying to work. The other thing is, now we have all the law enforcement people who've come around and said, I don't want to be going to these the sites of these accidents because people were too afraid to uh, to go get um, driver's license, mm -hmm. driver's training, because they're undocumented. So there are ways that the bills, they have to reconcile some of the details of it, not only know who the people are, they have to present certain kinds of documentation. They just can't idea, walk yeah. up and do that. Um, and, you know, there are folks who are on the front lines involved more than the rest of us with people who may be in these circumstances who are saying it's both a safety issue for all of us and a reality for us to respond to. So that is all I can say. What I would say is that probably most people don't know the details of the bill. Because if you're just looking at it as a, you know, and you don't know it, and you're like, okay, so we're now giving a license, willy-nilly giving driver's yeah, license. what's next? To undocumented. Do I have anything as a citizen? You know, what do I get as membership, you know, has its privileges, as Mary Express used to say. What, you know, what am I supposed to mm -hmm. be able to get out of that? And they, they, and they don't have to be documented. I mean, that's a question that has to be answered. So they are attempting to answer all of that by the details of the bill, by the limitations of the bill, by the boundaries of it. And there you have it. Um, Governor Baker is saying that he doesn't want, because we have a state in which if you have a driver's license be used to register to vote, to make certain that those protections are in place. Other folks who are working in that arena say they are, mm -hmm. and they will be strengthened by this. So that's how you respond to it. Um, and I wonder if this is a situation that reminds me of, it feels like a long time ago, but it wasn't. <coughs> when we start talking Bless about me. supporting gay marriage and the divisions <coughs> and how people Bless felt you. about it. And then at like a year later, you go back and you, all the people who were like, oh, it's gonna, you know, hell raining, it's over, we're dead, we're doomed. You know, that didn't happen. So nothing's going to change some mm -hmm. people's minds until they, you know, have lived with it for a time. But I don't think, you know, um, unless there is a racist tinge to it, I don't think that people saying, hey, as a citizen, I should have more benefits than people who do not, who are not citizens. I mean, you have to hear that. That's a that's a real thing. We're talking to the incredibly color coordinated color cross. <laughs> yeah. I'm just looking How about here. that ring? I have never you seen You should hold like that ring up so people can see Look that. The, I mean, Isn't that amazing? amazing? <laughs> that is one it's impressive. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, I go out in the public. I try to. Uh, I wish you know. <laughs> as so opposed to some of us, you mean? Thank you. So I didn't say that. <laughs>
The gym looks fetching today. What did okay, you say? Okay, fine. Marjorie. I think you changed Thank his T-shirt from yesterday. I did change yeah, my T-shirt. Yeah, very nice. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, the the new White House press secretary, yes. first black woman, first openly LGBTQ person. She's going to replace Jen Psaki. I think Jen Psaki's going to CNN or something. No, MSNBC. No, MSNBC. MSNBC. But it's not, I don't know if it's hundred percent clear. Yeah. It's pretty close yes. to hundred percent. She yeah. might have been going to CNN Plus, but as we know, so yeah, there's no <laughs> nobody's going to CNN yeah. Plus. Right. Plus. Yeah. So, uh, what do you know about this Kareen Jean Pierre? She's been around a, a while. If people, um, what, what was the, and I just can't remember, it was On the Move, some, no, the, the grassroots organization, advocacy group. Move On. Thank you. Move Thank On. You. Org. She was often a spokesperson for oh, Move I didn't On. Know that. Yes. So I've, you know, if you think about it, you probably saw her more than imagined. And she was very good at, you know, articulating the position of whatever the organization was, was uh, supporting at that time. So you know, she has all the requisite skills. She's ex very smart. Um, I, I also know that you know, her partner is Suzanne Malvo of CNN. I didn't know that. Yes, they have oh. a daughter. They live in D.C. Oh. That's been, you know, it's a long-term relationship. Wasn't she, what was she, a congresswoman or something? No, Susan? she no, was. She's a White House journalist. correspondent. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. why I know right. her name. Right. Okay, okay, right. that's why I know it. Um, and um, anyway, so, it's, you know, that's, so she's pretty much, it'll be interesting because I think the worst thing that could happen to her is to be compared to Jen Psaki, who's just like, you know, whip yeah. back to the, you know, and it She's takes really a good. rhythm. That's a hard, hard job. job. It's a hard job. Well, and especially I, when you make yourself available every day, right. which is what Psaki did. And by the way, the Trump administration yeah. people did in the beginning until they're embarrassed. And then what was the guy's right. name? Sean Spicer. Sean Spicer. Well, ridiculed Sean on Saturday Night <laughs> Live as well as anyone has ever been ridiculed. Yeah, he ran over the you reporters know. in like a little... <laughs> A Melissa McCarthy. McCarthy. Yeah. Melissa, Melissa McCarthy. McCarthy. Right. It was great. You know, yeah. you know uh, uh, there is nothing that Joe Biden can do right in the eyes of the American right. people. Every single thing he does gets thirty percent. The economy is atrocious, even though the great job numbers again today. The one legacy, uh, who knows what's going to happen in yeah. the next two years and what he does after that? He didn't just talk the talk about putting people That's of true. color gay and lesbian people, no. trans people in positions of power. This guy has delivered yes, big time has. on that promise. And this is yet another example of him honoring his commitment and I, I think changing the country because... Well, I would, I would underscore that and say that, you know, for all the people who are saying this is just another woke, and by the way, people who are still saying that, you're behind. <laughs> so stop it. But um, so this, is just stop it. this is another woke gesture don't really understand the impact of having somebody in the position, you know, where it becomes an ordinary exactly. situation, yeah. right. and you just you become accustomed to it, which you should, because it should be, and that takes on a whole other weight that you just can't even, um, those of us who often have not been in those positions can quantify, mm -hmm. but many people can't. So the impact of that, you know, if he did nothing else, just to have put people in place where they are interacting with folks who for the first time are seeing and normalizing. Remember all those kids um, that parents said the only president they ever knew was yeah. Barack Obama? And the parents had to say, well, that's not really actually <laughs> what's been, been normal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. Yeah, and, s and seeing them in the White right, House. Exactly. I mean, you had all these black families yeah, talking yeah. about that was a transformational yeah. moment. Speaking of, uh, of first, we have a little sound here, actually, uh, from the first black woman to serve on the yeah. International Space Station, Jessica Watkins. Is she talking about the legacy of black women in space? Here she is. I think it really is just a tribute to the legacy of the black women astronauts that have come before me, as well as to the exciting future ahead. Okay, then we have a Quick reflection, here. if we can, Kelly, on... Uh, oh, well, I mean, this is amazing. Uh, here's the number that just <laughs> stands out. Out of 248 astronauts who have visited the space station, only seven have been black. Um, I mean, I just know the names of, you know, a few who were pioneers, of course, that's Guion uh, Bluford, but Mae Jemison, of course, for is just fabulous. I have to give credit to my, the other sorority that Mae Jemison is a part of, <laughs> not mine. Uh, the Sounds like the Alpha Supreme Kappa Court Alpha. a little bit, don't you think? It really does, <laughs> yeah. those numbers. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, so what's I mean, on, what do you get on uh, Sunday night? It's a whole hour really about looking at, you know, sustainability and, and preservation. The first piece is about eco-villages. These are very deliberate communities that come together, built on the foundation of living in a communal space, but also everything is built in to foster and sustain sustainable living. Oh, it's really neat. quite interesting. Um, and we have, you know, some local communities here 
uh, in Massachusetts that we're talking to folks who are living there. It's quite fascinating. People are excited about it. And the second is this app that got started in Europe called Too Good To Go. Um, we've heard a number like Loving Spoons Bowls, love them. There are so many other, oh. so many other oh. places where they're trying to preserve food that gets wasted. This is at a very different level. This is like at a ground level. Um, and so they partner with like food convenience stores and small restaurants. It's an anti-waste kind it's of an anti -waste. So at the end of the day, those places uh, assess what they have that's too good to go and package it, and you, they resell it for an extremely low amount of money. So, like, mm -hmm. imagine 12 really good bagels for four bucks. Um, you know, wow. that kind of stuff. And it's just become very, very popular in Boston. They expanded to Boston not long ago. And um, so those two pieces together, there are ways to tackle some of this. We just got to keep, keep keep looking and, and trying to find them. So Kelly Crossy. Kelly Crossy, it's great to yeah. see Thank you, you as always. Much. Thank Thanks you. so much. Yeah. Kelly Crossy <laughs> is host of Under the Radar with Kelly Crossy, which you can catch Sunday nights right here on 89.7 at 6 o'clock. She also hosts Basic Black, which you can catch tonight, 7.30 on GBH2 or the GBH YouTube channel. Thank you very much, Callie. Coming up, journalist and naturalist Cy Montgomery joins us to share her encounters. This is an incredible story with birds of prey from her new book, The Hawk's Way, Encounters with Fierce Beauty. Cy Montgomery is next. You listen to 89.7 GBH, live from the Boston Public Library. Emergency pandemic rental aid is starting to run out in cities around the country, and people are having to make really tough decisions. Our tenants are having to decide between buying food for their children or their elderly parents or paying rent. And that's a real tight squeeze. Why evictions are up sharply this afternoon on All Things Considered from NPR News. Today at 4, here on GBH News 89.7. Our programs are made possible thanks to you. And Legal Seafoods. You can celebrate Mother's Day at Legal Seafoods and dine on dishes like their baked stuffed lobster. Location information and reservations at LegalSeafoods.com. If it isn't fresh, it isn't legal. And Newberry Court, a full-service residential community in Concord, Massachusetts, for persons 62 or over, committed to creating an active, independent lifestyle. More at NewberryCourt.org or 978-369-5155. <laughs> Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Browdy, Marjorie, and live at the Boston Public Library. Coming up in about 25 minutes, former Chief Justice of the uh, State Supreme Judicial Court, Margaret Marshall, who obviously wrote the decision on gay marriage. We're going to talk to her about that and whether it's at risk as well because of the abortion decision. A little bit later, the Metropolitan Corral is going to perform live here, and they are spectacular. But first, a single mistake handling a raptor, journalist and naturalist Simon Montgomery writes, even one you know well may provoke it to bite you, stab its talons in your flesh, or both. <laughs> Sounds good to me. That's our new fabulous book out this week. It's called The Hawk's Way, Encounters with Fierce Beauty. Here to tell us about these dangerous and beautiful living dinosaurs is Cy Montgomery. Cy is obviously a journalist, naturalist, New York Times bestselling author, BPR contributor. Two other things I will say about her. We've been talking to you for years. I think we've met you once ever yeah. in person. Which and here is she is. We're so happy here to she have is. you. And secondly, <laughs> secondly, we know she's thrilled because she's a great author to be at the library. But I know it's disappointing. You are not at a library that has a peeps diorama <laughs> like your hometown <laughs> library in Hancock. Is that upsetting to you, Simon oh, Montgomery? No, it is not at all. But it is my pleasure to present to both of you. Um, not the key to the city, because we don't have a city, okay. and we don't have any keys, because our doors are always open, but um, you can be honorary uh, residents of, of, Hancock? of Hancock, New Hampshire. There you go. <laughs> Population 1,700. Come to our Hancock market, um, and there you will meet everybody who hangs out Can there. we hear it for that? We <laughs> yes, didn't get a absolutely. key, but we did get... We did. <laughs> Thank so, you, Simon. So and thanks to the people of Hancock for their the generosity. Your latest book, I mean, you've written so many great books, but this latest one, I, th I think a lot of it, I didn't know anything about falconing. I, mean, I saw it Harry I. Potter. I think there was some falconing <laughs> in Harry Potter or something. So tell us how you got involved with these hawks through your friend uh, Nancy Cowan. Cowan, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. 
Well, yeah. my, my husband, Howard Mansfield, heard an advertisement on the radio in, I think, 2005 that a new school was opening up in Deering, New Hampshire, not far from us in Hancock, and it was the New Hampshire School of Falconry, and he knew right away that I had to, to go there. In fact, I was Nancy's first student, and I brought with me my friend, Celinda Chacoin, and it was the most amazing experience. We meet her. Um, she spoke with us a little bit about falconry and handed us each a bird of prey. I had on my glove jazz, a gorgeous Harris's hawk, big, big animal, um, mahogany eyes that looked like they were devouring the world and great strong yellow feet tipped in ebony talons. Um, Celinda had a lanner falcon and my instructor chose a peregrine falcon who, within the first five minutes of our meeting, bit her in the face. face. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> she's, we're walking down the street, three middle-aged ladies holding these birds of prey, one of them bleeding profusely <laughs> onto the sidewalk. And the next thing we know, someone pulls up, hands Nancy a dead bird from the back seat, which I thought she was going to feed the, to the hawks, but was going to eat for dinner. And I thought, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> what is this? Yeah. But you know, I'm I'm I've been a vegetarian for like 40 years, and if I see a squirrel hit on the road, I'm like sick for the rest of the day. But I was working with hunters. These birds are hunters, and once I looked into the eyes of this gorgeous, majestic creature, I felt like I was holding on my glove, wildness itself. And I wanted what that bird wanted. And in that way, I had hoped that I could become a worthy junior hunting partner. You know, Cy Montgomery, we have talked to you about many of your incredible relationships with uh, uh, animals. I mean, is Octavia was the name of the octopus? I always, yeah, Octavia. The Soul of the Octopus is one of the great interspecies books ever, uh, and Octavia was the octopus you had the relationship with, essentially, is that, okay. We were good friends. You were good, for, well, you're good friends, and the tactile connection between you, I mean, just, I've never read anything like this in my whole life. You make clear in your book, this is unlike the relationship between human, you, and hawk, or any human and hawk, is unlike any you've ever experienced in love, but you love this, so describe that relationship which, as you say, is not reciprocal in mm. lots of ways, and why this is okay with you, and why you loved it, not just okay with you. Yeah, well, I've, I've had a lot of animal friends, including octopus, and usually through gentle touch, you can become good friends with these creatures. I mean, pigs and dogs, and um, even I got a rhinoceros to run over, uh, roll over once by touching. <laughs> I mean, it, it wasn't, it was somebody's rhinoceros. It wasn't like a wild rhinoceros. Don't try this at home. But, <laughs> um, but a hawk is totally different. And it was more alien to me, I think, than, than even an octopus, even though we're more closely related to birds. Um, who are the descendants of theropod dinosaurs yeah. than we are to octopuses, because we go back, our last common ancestor with an octopus is half a billion years ago when everybody was a tube. So um, when I meet a new animal, um, I'm just open to whatever it is that they want. They do not want to be touched. They do not want to be stroked. So right away, the normal way that you kind of get to know somebody, once that you convince them that you're not going to hurt them, n normally the way you get someone like that to know you is through touch, but they don't want that. They want something totally different. They want something totally different from what I want. They want to chase and capture and kill and eat prey. That is the thing that they love to do. And they want you to help facilitate that behavior, do they right. not? Right. Otherwise, you have very little to offer them. So and why I want to know why I want to know wait one second. I want to know why that's satisfying to you when there isn't the reciprocity. And then you have to tell us what you did to the rhinoceros to get it to roll over. Yeah. I'm afraid to ask, but uh, uh, why is that satisfying to you? Well, to me. 
so many of the other relationships that we have with with people and animals um, is sort of transactional, uh -huh. you know? Um, the Greeks had four different kinds of, they named four different kinds of love, and one was philios, from which we get the word philanthropy, mm -hmm. the friendship love, and you mm -hmm. expect reciprocity from your friends, and eros is, you know, the, the romantic love, yeah. and you expect your husband or spouse or partner to love you back, and storage, our children, we expect them to love us, and they expect us to love them back. But agape, the highest form of love that the Greeks identified, is the kind of love that um, in the Bible we feel for the creator and the creator feels for us. It's not, it's, it's not reciprocal, mm. it's not transactional. In, unless, you know, oh Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? <laughs> <laughs> but um, that kind of love is tremendously freeing to experience that kind of love, to love a hawk simply for being wildness, to love it like you love um, a lightning storm or a waterfall, to love it like you love a, the ocean or a sunset just because it's there and it doesn't have to give you anything. Just being in its presence is a blessing. And that's what I feel with a hawk on my arm. We're talking to Sai Montgomery. Her latest is The Hawk's Way, Encounters with Fierce Beauty. So you, you talk about being the hunting partner of the hawk and how you have the heavy mitt on and the hawk lands on your arm. Why, why does the hawk need a hunting partner? And why does the hawk stay on your arm? Well, it doesn't desperately need you as a hunting partner. Some, um, some species of hawks do hunt with fellow hawks. The Harris hawk the species that, that I write about the most, who I knew the best, um, one of whom lives on our street, by the way. We have, we have a Harris hawk living with my, my friend and falconer, Henry Walters, right on our street. Um, they do hunt uh, cooperatively. But if you can demonstrate that I might be able to scare up some game when I'm walking through the understory, I might make a little vole dart out, and the hawk, who is now perched in a tree, knows that I can be of use to, to, to them, um, then they will be interested in you. And the same thing with dogs. Most hawks would not like a dog. In fact, they'll scream at a dog, like, I hate you, I hate you. They'll stand in, a, in the tree and just hurl abuse at the dog. <laughs> but if the dog has had an opportunity to point to game, and if the hawk sees, like, ooh, that, that dog is pointing out something useful to me. It goes into the file folder in their brain, hunting success, hunting success, and now they're not going to scream at that hawk anymore. Now, I mean, that, that dog anymore. They are going to watch that dog, and they'll learn it really fast. Yeah, so I, I want to add a third question to Marjorie's list about when the hawk uh, alights on your... What is that glove called? There's a name for it, isn't there? Was there a name for the oh, glove? A glove. Oh, Falcon glove. ring glove, glove. yeah. Glove, okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, that was my third question. Thank you for humiliating me. No, the I'm third, sorry. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. The third question is... When it, like when you had that first experience with jazz, and it's on your arm, why didn't it, didn't it I mean this is, why didn't it eat your face? I mean, <laughs> why does the hawk decide until it gets to know if you're of use to it or somebody, as you, or, or him or her, as you would call the, I'm sure, the uh, hawk, why doesn't it attack you. I don't, I don't get that part. Well, sometimes they do. Well, if I know you, make you describe mistake, it, but yeah, but, <laughs> but why don't they, in all cases, since they don't know to, that you're, a, as I say, of value to them? Well, when you start um, your relationship with a hawk, you can offer it food on your glove, and it'll come, oh. to, your, it'll come to your glove. Um, to my horror, this, the food is often like baby dead yeah chicks cut up and I, you know some of my friends and family have been chickens I've raised them in my office sitting in my sweater and um, I really had to get over this you know these are these frozen dead baby chicks and they're cutting their heads off and it was very hard to get get past that but my my desire to be near the hawk and to learn from it was was so strong I could get past the, the disgust and, and horror of the decapitated chicks. <laughs> but ex explain to, I mean, you mentioned one of your neighbors is a falconer. So the hawks fly away to get their prey, and then they come back. 
-hmm. So obviously they have some kind of relationship with the person that's the owner. So talk a little bit about that. Well, the hawk, um, if, if you've been able to show them that you're a worthy hunting partner and that you can be trusted, um, right before they've had all they want to eat, you try to figure out, like, when should I call it out of the sky to my glove? And you call it out of the sky to your glove with How a do bit you call of food. It? Oh, you, you whistle, okay. or um, you can just, sometimes you can just slap the glove. Okay. Um, Hold up a chicken, whatever. Well, you have a tiny bit of a chicken. Their eyes are amazing. I mean, they can see this from very far away. Their eyes are twice the size of their brain. I know. That is, well, let's get to that in a second. I, <laughs> yeah. I, I couldn't get over that, but go ahead. So they can see, like the little yeah. chick head, even if they're, you know, hundreds of feet away, they see that you're holding something delicious. And so they'll, they'll come to you. And um, they have little anklets on them called jesses. And so if the hawk is, is done hunting or you're done with a training session, you can hook them up to the jesses and then bring them, bring them back to the house. But, you know, if you make a mistake or if your hawk just decides you're useless or if your hawk decides something is more interesting than you, they can fly away. They are so not your pet. They are so not under your control at all. But when they live with the neighbor, where do they live? Um, at night, they sleep in a, an aviary called a muse. Okay. And they are safe there from um, raptors, you know, like owls who might want to eat them, and, and warm. Um, and in the morning, he comes and, and feeds Mahood, um, and then they go out hunting together. And do they do this several th every day, several times a week? I think whenever they, whenever they can. Yeah. The thing about um, the Harris hawk is they're a southwestern species, so they really hate snow. Oh. And no one likes to fly in the rain. Yeah. So, you know, if it's raining, if it's snowing, you know, they don't, at least Harris hawks don't want to go anywhere. So they're you just know, hanging out at home. Simon, so I'm sorry. Simon Go ahead. Simon Montgomery, there are beautiful photographs in this book, too, by the way. Who took the photographs? Beautiful. Tia Strombeck, my friend. Fabulous. Look at this one. one She's like four inches away from I know. this hawk well, looking right at you. Well, actually, even closer, my favorite photograph is a beautiful profile of your now late friend, unfortunately, to whom you dedicate the book, Nancy Cowan, with this, with this hawk on her left shoulder. It's a beautiful profile of both. But the takeaway from me is what you just mentioned. I couldn't get, take my eyes off the eyes of these hawks. First of all, when you said a minute ago, uh, Simon Montgomery, that their eyes are twice the size of their brains, you mean that literally? Yes, that yes. Correct? Yes. So you can extrapolate if that was in a human being, it'd be like the size of a watermelon or whatever. Right, yeah. That whatever. We, we would have eyes, if our eyes were as big as, say, an owl's, our eyes would be the size of oranges. That's incredible. <laughs> so w describe the eye of the hawk and obviously how valuable it is to it in doing what it does, which is be a predator, a hunter. Yeah, they, um, because they're flying creatures, your eyes need to apprehend your environment in greater detail and more rapidly than mm. our eyes do. And we're primates, so we, we care a lot about our vision. Right. You know, and our other senses are relatively weak. We can hear okay, our sense of smell is terrible, but compared to a raptor, we are Mr. Magoo. <laughs> um, <laughs> they can be hundreds thousands of feet in the air and see over an area of like two miles in exquisite detail. And they probably see colors we can't even name. The numbers of receptors, they have like a million um, light receptors in their eyes. We have something like 200,000. Um, so what they see, like when, when we from an airplane look down and we see broccoli, you know, when we see trees, it just looks like a bunch of broccoli, to them, they can see each individual leaf and probably in colors that we cannot describe. And they can also see with great rapi rapidity. So a hummingbird's wing, which looks like a blur to us, they see slow individual wing beats. Oh my God. Yeah. What so was the name? Your last book was on hummingbirds. Speaking of, what was the name of the hummingbird book? If you want that to grab was a that. Beautiful the Hummingbird's book. Gift. That the was a beautiful book. Gift. So, so if, if we see a hawk somewhere, you know, when we're out with our little dogs, we should be keep our eye on the little dog and the hawk. Yeah, particularly um, the first, I think, the first prey item that the peregrine falcons left, let, huh, hunted um, when they were reintroduced to New York City was unfortunately a chihuahua and not a pigeon. Oh. So, yeah. Um, little 
dogs, if you see a peregrine overhead, I would take your dog in. But you know what? Um, our uh, border collie was hunted, although not attacked, by a gray horned owl, a border collie. We, That's my, a pretty good sized dog, I right? I know, 40 pound dog. Well, actually, that was Tess, so she was more like 30 pounds. But um, great horned owls hunt skunks. And she was black and white because oh she was a border God. collie. And my husband was out, and he saw this like thing, like a giant cinder float out of nowhere while he was taking Tess out in the evening. And it swooped down. And it's, it, you could, the owl thought, you know, that looks like a delicious skunk. Oh, no, it's not a skunk. And it left. <laughs> Wow. Wow. I don't think I'll be going to Hancock anytime soon. <laughs> the, the honor that was bestowed on us, Simon Montgomery, I'll tell you. I mean, this is pretty unusual stuff, though. I, I mean, I'd never, like I said, except for the Harry Potter things, I, I, I'd heard of, you know, falconers. But, I mean, I didn't really know they were existing up there in New Hampshire or anyplace else. Well, it's because of Nancy that... The New Hampshire School of Falconry was, was founded. And who goes to the New Hampshire School of Falconry? Well, right now, alas, since, since she died, yeah. um, the, the school is going to move somewhere to Massachusetts, and one of, one of her apprentices is going to um, be able to practice, you know, teach people falconry there. Um, but, gosh, it was, I was so lucky to be her first student, and I was so lucky to keep coming back and back and back, and I would bring friends of mine, friends of mine from the aquarium would come. And it's just the most amazing thing to see this, this living dinosaur come flying toward you on purpose to land on your glove. And to and eat your face. <laughs> I, I, are you not, I ask you this almost all the time when we're talking about some wild, are you not scared? I know you love everything that is breathing and living. We're not going to ask you about the rats we were talking about yesterday because I know you love them too. <laughs> it's but true. are you not petrified when this damn uh, bird is flying down to your glove that you're holding up with a little food that you're its next food? You're not s nervous about that? I am petrified oh, of you are? a cocktail party. <laughs> <laughs> With humans, of course. Uh, so, uh, uh, how how heavy are these birds? When they land on your on your forearm, they're pretty heavy. Well, you'd think uh, you feel them. I mean, actually, smack onto your glove with their big claws. Right, and you feel the squeeze. Yeah. But it's not from their weight so much as from the v velocity. Yeah. That they're coming at you. So you could so, be knocked right over. Well, I mean, I don't I don't think I'd be knocked over because I was ready. I was yep. ready for it. But I understand why people, some people would not be happy to see a, a raptor yeah, coming claws first. Yeah, that's right. You know, I saw um, Jurassic Park. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, our kind, our ancestors, the Australopithecines, um, when you and I were in college, we probably, I'm sure you've heard of uh, Raymond Dart's discovery of the Tong child, which was a young hominid who they thought was killed by a leopard when we were in college. But then that fossil has been re-examined. It was not killed by a leopard. It was killed by a huge hawk. Mm. It's yes. comforting. Oh, you know, before God. you go, can we end with a question <laughs> you never answered? What'd you do to the rhinoceros? I'm totally serious about this. What does the rhinoceros weigh? Like 3,000 pounds, 2,000 pounds? They're big pounds? animals, okay. yeah. So first of all, I assume everything you say, I take it face value, you literally got it to roll over on its back. I did. What I did, did you do to the rhinoceros? Well, first, I do, do want to reiterate this wasn't a wild rhinoceros. Well, it was nevertheless, rhinoceros. it's still a rhinoceros. I, still. I used a technique that um, worked on my pig, Christopher Hogwood, and will work on people if you know them well enough. Okay. You rub their inguinal region. Excuse me? What's that? <laughs> So no well, about that. it's it's kind of um, where your legs join your belly, not all the way under there, because okay. you're not getting that familiar. No, I hope not. Yeah. No, no, no. But um, they they like being rubbed there, and they just flip over in porcine bliss. That is unbelievable. Like a dog. Yes, like a dog, wow. like a pig. I mean, everyone seems to like that. <laughs> <laughs> Even okay. right now, can I tell you something? <laughs> Marjorie and I were talking. This, you are amazing. I mean, not only your relationship with other species, but this <coughs> book. Is so terrific and gives such insight in ways that I couldn't even imagine. You're amazing, Cyan. It's great to see you in person. We really yeah, thank you love very, very much. Thank, thank you, so you for much. our, our T-shirts. I'm very happy <laughs> about that.
Sam Montgomery is a journalist, naturalist, and Boston Public Radio contributor. Her latest book is The Hawk's Way, Encounters with Fierce Beauty, and she's written so many terrific books, which you will enjoy. Thank you again, Sam Montgomery. You know, next time you're here, if you, uh, in person, if you could bring that uh, domesticated rhinoceros with oh, you sure, yeah. and do it, we'd <laughs> love to see the technique. Sai, it's great to see you. Okay, coming up, we're going to talk to... Say hi to the people in Hancock. Absolutely. We're going to talk to former Massachusetts Supreme Court Judicial Court Chief Justice Margaret Marshall on what the Roe decision could mean for us here in the Commonwealth. And of course, you may have heard her name many times before because she uh, was on the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court when gay marriage uh, was passed. You're listening to Boston Public Radio 89.7 GBA. She wrote. May is finally here, which means it's time to throw on the short shorts, get outside, and live it up. I'm James Bennett II from the GBH News Culture Desk, bringing you The Drop, a monthly roundup of the can't-miss stuff in Boston. We're talking a Benefit for Ukraine relief concert, presented by the Boston Philharmonic, and decidedly sauced Shakespeare. Discover all that and more with The Drop, available now at gbhnews.org slash the drop. Support for our programs comes from you and the Office of the Massachusetts State Treasurer. The Unclaimed Property Division is holding unclaimed funds for the citizens and businesses of the Commonwealth. You can see if you have unclaimed money at findmassmoney.com. And Sunbug Solar, offering solar and battery storage renewable energy solutions for your home or business. To learn how you can build a more resilient future, you can visit sunbugsolar.com. Trusted. Local news. This is 89.7 WGBH, WGBH HD1 Boston, online at gbhnews.org. Boston's local NPR. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. I am Jim Browdy. She is Marjorie Egan. We are at the Bo whoops, Boston Public Library. Turn on your video, Jim. As we continue to try to make sense of the Supreme Court's draft decision, and may, many people think essentially its final decision on Roe v. Wade and abortion in America, it's clear the implications may be big for many things, women's rights, reproductive rights, and beyond. What other seemingly settled rights could fall? Joining us now on the line is the former Chief Justice of the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court. As you know, almost two decades ago, she wrote the decision embracing gay marriage here in Massachusetts. I have to say, one of our favorite guests through the years, Chief Justice Marshall. Margaret Marshall, it's great to see you as always. Thanks so much. Thank, thank you, Jim and Marjorie. It's great to be back again. Yes, thank you very much for joining us. Jim, you have to turn your Zoom camera around because no one can see oh, you. Oh, sorry about that. It's okay. okay. So, uh, I thought you... <laughs> I'm there here. he is, there he is. So, uh, Justice Marshall, um, tell us what you make of the Alito uh, leaked opinion about Roe v. Wade. I had two initial reactions. The first was stunned that a draft opinion had been leaked. It just doesn't happen. And so I immediately had empathy for Chief Justice Roberts because the Chief Justice does not want anything like this ever to land on his or her desk. And the second was, as I started reading the draft opinion, I was shocked at the language yeah. that Justice Alito is using. Um, there are many ways that one can write an opinion, but particularly when a justice knows that uh, an opinion will be deeply divisive to large parts of our nation, whichever side it is, at least it had been my practice, and I think on the Supreme Judicial Court with some of our most controversial decisions, one attempts to pay respect to the other side. But you know, um, Roe was egregiously wrong from the beginning. Yeah. Well, you may not dis you may not agree with um, the reasoning of the opinion, but it clearly wasn't egregiously wrong from the beginning. Those are terms that we have <coughs> used only with some of the great mistakes 
that the court has made um, the Dred Scott decision, the Plessy against Ferguson saying on in racial issues, separate is equal, not separate is unequal. Uh, the decision upholding the internment of Japanese citizens in the United States. I mean, those are egregious from the beginning. This was not an egregious from the beginning. So that was number one. Number two, two of the justices, of course, who I respect a great deal were Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. Uh, O'Connor. And it seemed to me that Justice Alito was almost singling out his anger, his vitriol, um, at not only Justice Ginsburg, because of what she had said about the Roe opinion, but uh, Justice O'Connor in uh, Planned Parenthood against Casey, which was a later decision, which in some respects attempted to flesh out in a different kind of way the reasoning behind Roe against Wade. And so I was left with a feeling about why is this man so angry? And why is he spewing his vitriol, um, you know, across this nation? It, it seemed to me an, the least kind of thing that I would have expected uh, in a justice who had been assigned to write a pretty controversial decision. Now, this is assuming I mean, we now know from Chief Justice Roberts that this is authentic. Mm -hmm. I assume when he used that term, he meant authentic in the sense that uh, Justice Alito had written it. Of course, it's not the final product. Um, <laughs> you know, draft opinions go through many, many, many drafts. Um, and I don't know why or by whom it was leaked, of course, but even an initial draft, this is unusual in my estimation. You know, you know it, oh, I'm sorry. I, I just want um, to, I'm so glad you mentioned Alito's seeming anger and the, and the almost rage you could feel coming through the opinion and his lack of concern for the other side. I just want to read a brief excerpt from what you wrote in 2003 about legalizing same-sex marriage, which I thought was beautiful. You said, marriage is a vital social institution, the exclusive commitment of two individuals to each other. To nur it nurtures love, mutual support. It brings stability to our society. It fulfills yearnings for security, safe haven, and connection that express our common humanity. That's what you wrote about marriage in a beautiful way and it, 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 with none of that kind of rage that I felt anyway coming from Justice Alito. I think, Marjorie, in addition to that, I, you know, <laughs> I don't go back and read my opinions over and over again. They're not what puts me to sleep every night. You should. They're but pretty good, <laughs> Margaret Marshall. Trust me, we have gone back and read them. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but one of the things that I think I tried to do, even in the Goodrich decision and in other decisions, is to say we recognize that there are different views on this. Right. I mean, there's a recognition that there were many people who found, um, you know, same-sex marriage unacceptable. I mean, there was a recognition. And I have to say that, um, and I don't think I'm, I'm revealing any confidences of the court, the justices, my, the justices on, on, who were in dissent, uh, the justices, Justice Graney, who joined me in a concurrence, I think we worked very hard to make, to make sure that we were explaining to the people of Massachusetts the legal basis for our disagreement. There were no ad hominem, I hate to use the term ad hominem, but ad hominem attacks. There were no personal attacks. Um, at least I hope there weren't. Uh, and I, I don't think that anybody has ever held up either uh, my uh, decision or Justice Sussman or Justice Cordy and said, look at this language, you know, who are these people? I, I think it does such a great disservice. I mean, I revere the courts, I revere the United States system of the rule of law. It is a constitutional system that has worked with, I mean, with some major problems, but we are the longest lived democracy anywhere ever. I think in order to 
maintain that democracy, you have to have a reasonableness, a kind of reasoned judgment. We are not thugs duking it out in the public square. Well, with all due respect, Justice Marshall, I think we are thugs duking it out in the public square. We have an insurrectionist uh, uh, party that appears primed to take control with the votes of the American people of the House and the Senate. That same party, and with respect to Justice Roberts, has eviscerated voting rights and it's getting worse in the states. And now this overturning of a fundamental right for women, is, is that not thug-like behavior in a teetering democracy to you, Justice Marshall? I stand corrected. I was thinking about the 200 years that went before it. <laughs> you know, and again, if you're looking at it from the point of view of African Americans, they would say there was thuggery from the beginning. And so perhaps I was cho cho uh, choosing my w words incorrectly. But there were moments, I mean, long moments, mm -hmm. Um, where I think we have tried to reach accommodation with each other, tried to listen to both sides. At least that's what I was taught in law school. In fact, one of the, you know, one of the ways you get taught as a lawyer is what is the best argument on the other side? I mean, you're always trying to listen to the other side, trying to be respectful. And I do agree with you. Um, you as you know, I come from South Africa, and yes, I am deeply, deeply disturbed at what is happening in this country. I've always felt um, you know, so welcomed and so respected and so um, embraced by the United States as I have um, embraced the United States. I mean, it's, it's been wonderful to me and I'm a very proud citizen. I am very worried. I'm worried about hate speech I, I'm genuinely worried about hate speech because I know what hate speech leads to. I'm genuinely worried about the attacks um, on judges. I'm genuinely worried. I am profoundly and deeply worried about the attempts to remove um, citizens from the voter rolls. I think that is an outrageous development. Um, I think it was Heather Cox Richardson who said, <laughs> you know, we are now having justices appointed from a minority of a minority of a minority. And again, getting back to Justice Alito to say, well, of course, you know, women can now vote and everybody can go and vote and we can, you know, work this out uh, in the voting field as opposed to judicial field when we know that there are serious attempts in this country to take away the vote. I mean, not only from African Americans, but, you know, from to kind to strengthen one political party, the Republican Party, to make it almost impossible to have a bipartisan system. And by the way, while I'm thinking about it, I think one of the challenges that we have is that for so long, I think we have taken democracy and what it takes to keep a democracy going for granted. Yeah. Yeah. And I felt that particularly working in the state courts. Um, through my work as Chief Justice, I had an opportunity to meet Chief Justices from um, many states, from all 50 states, and our territories, Guam and the United States, Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, and so on. And I can say, I, can, I could almost feel it in my lifetime. In 1999, when I became Chief Justice, and I met for the first time the chief justices from other states, some of whom were elected after very expensive campaigns like Texas and some of whom were elected in Iowa or Wisconsin. I mean, Massachusetts is one of the few places that doesn't have elected judges. And I would say that by and large, judicial elections were rather routine affairs. And I had many of those chief justices telling me that they actually approved of being elected. I don't think any of the elected justices today would say that. They have become so partisan, so vitriolic, so um, awful. And a lot of that I lay at the feet of the United States Supreme Court. Why? Because in all states, we used to have something called a judicial code of ethics. Very important code of ethics that essentially said Justices couldn't sit on cases where they had their wives involved in front of them. 
justices, even in elections, couldn't say, vote for me and I guarantee I will not uphold abortion or vote for me and I will never set aside a death penalty or vote for me and I will never allow gay marriage. You were not allowed to do that. There was a challenge to those codes of judicial ethics and the United States Supreme Court in a blistering opinion by Justice Scalia said, oh, we've got the First Amendment. If you're gonna have elections, you're allowed to say anything. And so now in state after state after state, um, justices, judges, when they're running for election, including sitting judges, are allowed to say whatever they want to say, whatever they want to say. Fortunately, you can't do that in Massachusetts. You know, but it's really, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jim. You know, I'll talk just, it endlessly. <laughs> <laughs> and we love when you do. By the way, to show up, times have changed for people who are not familiar with the history of uh, Justice Marshall's ascension. Uh, nominated to the court by a Republican, nominated for elevation to Chief Justice by another Republican governor. So I want to talk to you about uh, the, something else Alito said in his decision. He went out of his way to say, I'm applying this, this uh, uh, approach of mine and my four colleagues, I'm paraphrasing obviously, to unenumerated rights that only relates to the matter before us. Uh, and uh, theoretically saying to people, not overtly, but I guess indirectly, this has nothing to do with other, quote, unenumerated rights. A lot of people think that the reasoning that Alito uses in this case, Justice Marshall, is the same reasoning this same group of five will use to ultimately overrule something like Obergefell, the obviously Supreme Court's decision long after yours on same-sex marriage. Do you think the way this decision is written, assuming this is what ends up being the opinion come June, does open the door to attack the right to contraception, the right to marry whoever you love regardless of their gender? Are they all at risk? Yes, and I'll tell you why. One, what he's, when the United States Supreme Court in particular, but any court says, this is a one-off, this is a one-off. It, you know, it's, we've got just this one, mm -hmm. and it won't be repeated anywhere. It is never a one-off. Bush against Gore, if you go back and read those opinions, the one that essentially handed the opinion to President Bush, all over those opinions, this is a one-off, this is a one-off. It is not a one-off. Federal courts were really not involved, believe it or not, in, in elections, state and federal elections. So if... Um, you know, if, if um, Catherine Clark challenged something before Bush against Gore, it would end up in the Supreme Judicial Court, Catherine Clark being my uh, congressional representative, mm -hmm. my congressional representative, would not end up in the, Supreme, uh, in the Supreme Court, it would end up in the Supreme Judicial Court. Since Bush against Gore, there have been tons of cases brought in the federal courts challenging how a state is running its voting. So first, number one, do never believe when a judge says this is a one-off because we work on a system of precedence, believe it or not. Second, it's the reasoning of the court. It is not what's, what's the particular issue. It's Justice Alito's reasoning. And when he says um, any such right that we recognize, quote, must be deeply rooted in this nation's history and tradition, and implicit in the concept of ordered liberty, all kinds of things are not deeply rooted in our nation's history and traditions. Let, let me say this as simply as I can. One of the marvels, one of the most impressive aspects of democracy in the United States is that the legions of people who were excluded who didn't have the right to vote, who were not included in the constitutional negotiations, who did not attend anything in Philadelphia or Boston or Richmond or any place else, who were not in the draft, who were trying to push their way through, as Abigail Adams did. Do you remember her famous phrase, remember the ladies? Yeah. Well, they certainly yeah. did not remember the ladies, that was for sure. Um, and over you know, more than two centuries, through hard work, through lobbying, through gumshoe work, through talking on talk radio, wonderful talk radios like this, little by little by little, 
excluded groups have pushed their way through precisely because they were not part of the deeply rooted traditions. And so when Justice Alito uses that phrase, it essentially in one sentence wipes out everything that we have achieved. Let, you know, I remind people that when I decided the same-sex marriage case, the United States had tossed that aside 50 years before. A couple, a same-sex couple, claimed that they brought a case saying they wanted to marry each other. It actually went to the United States Supreme Court. People forget this. And in a one sentence, I mean, the United States just dismissed it. Well, that community of people who didn't have access to marriage kept on going, kept on going for 50 years. And believe me, gay marriage was not deeply rooted in anything. The fact that women did not lose all of their property when they married, that was the deeply rooted mm -hmm. in our tradition and history. Fortunately now, when one marries a woman, marries a man, you don't lose. I don't lose all of my property. I don't have to have uh, the first house I bought in Boston, um, you know, some 50 years ago, I remember my wonderful lawyer, who subsequently became a judge, saying, you know, I can't just do it in the name of Margaret Marshall. You have to use your husband's name. I said, I never use my husband's name. He said, well, I just think in an abundance of caution, you better use your husband. I mean, we've come a long way. Um, you know, I stand on the shoulders of generations of women, generations of women. And for a justice of the Supreme Court to say, you know, we're not going to recognize any rights that are not deeply rooted in our traditions and history. I can't imagine what that feels like to African Americans or to, um, or to women. I mean, I feel it intensely as a woman. Um, so yes, I am troubled now. Um, one of the, I think Justice Alito said this, or perhaps it's a commentator has said, well, of course, you know, things like gay marriage, they're so popular now. Well, depending on how you ask the question, we know that a vast majority of American people want to have access to some form of abortion. If you ask the question, do you think there should be abortion in any circumstances? The answer is no for a lot of people. In other words, you can't go in mm -hmm. at eight and a half months and say, I want to have an abortion. Mm -hmm. And so over time, I think the court has tried to wrestle with, um, you know, how to recognize um, the deeply personal dignity of a woman who's pregnant at the same time recognizing at some point, um, the rights of a fetus. Those are not easy decisions. But most of what we would think of, of countries that are like ours in the sense that they're democratic countries, you know, have recognized abortion, including the most conservative mm. ones, Ireland most oh, recently, no. which surely um, must say something, at least in Boston, when so many people in Boston have either uh, immediately came from Ireland or have their parents, grandparents, great grandparents, great great parents coming from Ireland. Again, one, the issue here is not, can the state force me to have an abortion? This may be very personal, Jim, but I think you and Marjorie know that I couldn't have children. Now, you'd be surprised at how many people assume that I didn't want to have children or I must have had an abortion. I couldn't have children. And yet I understand in some deep level that had I been pregnant, I do not want the state telling me what to do. I don't want the state telling me with whom I can share my life. I mean, I think that's where we should be. One so, last point, if I can. Of course. <laughs> you yes. Can, you can cut me off. No. Up. This, is, this is something that I say to people. There are 
the United States was the only constitutional court from 1780, beginning with Massachusetts, or 1787, beginning with the United States, and a constitutional democracy in the sense that judges uh, who were not elected could set aside uh, laws enacted by the duly, rep duly elected representatives uh, of, you know, who passed a law. That began to change, first changed in Germany in 1948, was the first country that, that moved to a constitutional democracy for obvious reasons. Many of the things that happened during the Hitler regime uh, had been passed through the German parliament. But then by the end of the 20th century, really every new country, uh, certainly South Africa, for example, and many old countries like Canada adopted a constitutional form of democracy. Now these constitutions differ. But they basically, in terms of the basic rights, they're very similar. Right um, to freedom of the press, freedom of religion, freedom of association, you know, the rights ones that we would recognize. They differ in two major uh, respects, almost everyone. Nobody has a right to bear arms. Just not in these new constitutions. Almost every, if not every new constitution has an explicit right to privacy. Now, that presents a challenge for judges in the United States. There are many people who suggest that the Fourth Amendment and the right not to have your home searched or papers, you know, having the British soldiers, you know, beat their way through the door and take rifle through your papers was a protection or the right to privacy. But I think we could also understand that the developments of the intrusiveness of either government or in technology have changed that reality. And somehow American courts have to deal with that. There is not an explicit mm -hmm. right to privacy in the sense that there is in other contemporary constitutions. Can we deal with that? Of course we can deal with it. We've dealt with it for decades. For decades, not only in sort of, you know, who you marry and who you live with, and, but in a whole variety of circumstances. We recognize that there's some the right to be left alone. There's some area where the state uh, should not have the right to intervene. You convinced us, Justice Marshall, and uh, <laughs> it's wonderful to see you and speak to you yeah. again. Can't thank you enough for your time. Thank you, sir. And I have to say, I was listening to your wonderful interview with Simon Montgomery. Oh. I'm a great, uh, uh, you know, great fan of hers, and uh, it was just wonderful to hear her talking to you as well. It, it was a little tough for me to follow her because to go from hawks to this is, <laughs> I would rather hang out with the hawks. So. <laughs> I think well, you did it quite well, a Justice wonder, it's Marshall. It's a wonderful book. Margaret Marshall, great thank you, you so much for being with us. Thanks we really, so really appreciate it. <laughs> That was, of course, Margaret Marshall. She Change was the, world. the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court Chief Justice who wrote the landmark decision in 2004 allowing gay marriage in Massachusetts, the first in the country. And we're very, very grateful for your time, Justice. Thank you so much for being with us. Coming up, we have a real treat coming up. We are going to have a live performance here from the Metropolitan Chorale ahead of their show next week of Duke Ellington's Sacred Concert. We're going to hear some incredible music and some incredible tap dancing. That is next on Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GBH.
Lord.org. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. We're live at the Boston Public Library, and we're glad we are. I'm Jim Browder. She's Marge Regan. This is Live Music Friday, and it continues on Boston Public Radio at the BPL. By the way, we were not supposed to do this till the end of the show, but Marjorie and I signaled to each other we couldn't wait any longer <laughs> for this. So with us today are members of the Metropolitan Chorale. They conclude their 2021-2022 concert season next Sunday with a show at the First Church in Cambridge. We'll tell you how to get tickets in a couple of minutes. Performing Duke Ellington's Sacred Concert with soprano Gabrielle Goodman, who is here. Tap dancer Ian Berg was here in the Boston Jazz Orchestra, 15-piece big band. We're going to uh, get into the first piece in a couple of minutes. First, we're joined by the music director of this operation for quite a number of years, Lisa Graham. Good to see you, Lisa. How good to be yes, together again. Yes, great to see and you again, too. And in a couple of minutes, we're going to be joined by soloist Gabrielle Goodman. She's a professor of music at the Berklee College of Music. I should say, by the way, that uh, Lisa teaches at uh, Wellesley. Uh, Gabrielle is uh, a professor of music in the voice department. She's performed both classical and jazz idioms with the Syracuse Symphony, the Baltimore Symphony, the Baltimore Opera, the National Symphony, a symphony, a symphony, and a few people you might have heard of, like Roberta Flack, Chaka Khan, and Patti LaBelle. Oh my God, Gabrielle, it's great to have you as well, as well as all the, the members of your chorus. Hello, Lisa Graham. Hello. We are so excited Yeah, we're well, great to see you. So before we hear some actual live music here at the Boston Public Library, just tell people who may not know, what's the deal with the uh, chorus here? The deal with the chorus is they're going to sing some Duke Ellington, part of a work called Sacred Concerts. He composed it between 65 and 1973. And these are just a few pieces drawn from uh, a number of uh, performances over those years. Well, you have to go over there and lead them in a second. I Before do, you yeah. go, tell people if they don't even know, I gave you 10 seconds. What is this Metropolitan? Thing. That's a really good question. <laughs> what is it? We're an audition choir. We, uh, we're located in Brookline. We rehearse there. We have a full concert season. We're about 100 members strong, and uh, we have made it through the pandemic and are performing live again for audiences. Yeah, you perform a lot at the All Saints Church, right? We yeah. do, in Brookline yeah. and in Boston and all over the metro. Two of my favorite people narrated something for you at that church. They were incredible, <laughs> Vaguely by the remember way. those people. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Well, you're going to tell us more about it in a minute. Again, oh, well. what's the first selection we're going to hear? We're going to start with the majesty of God, and that uh, is the whole ensemble. And uh, Gabrielle starts this in the most beautiful way. Uh, Rebecca Klein and uh, Greg Ryan, take it away. The beauty of God is indescribable. The power of God is unappraisable. The sight of God is indescribable, and we should know. The light of God is true and does not
Metropolitan Corral. They're going to do two more selections in a minute. Gabrielle, do you want to join us up here if you can with Lisa? Wow. Yeah. So tell us what we about what we just heard. So uh, in 1965, Duke Ellington was commissioned to uh, write a, a piece of music to uh, consecrate uh, the cathedral in San Francisco, known as Grace Cathedral. Uh, he had written a wonderful piece called Black, Brown, and Beige earlier in the 60s, and it featured a piece, Come Sunday, which is iconic Ellington uh, sacred ballad, and people were inspired by that. The leadership, they said, write a whole extended work uh, for jazz, for, for band, and he, uh, that's where he added the dance number as well. But this was not a typical Duke Ellington. This is sort of a departure for him, Gabrielle, is it not? It's a different treatment because uh, most of Duke Ellington's work was secular. It was, it referred to romantic love and things of that nature, and it wasn't based on his love for God. And so uh, this is different in that way. Okay, oh, now I think I'm good. This Go is ahead. different in that way. Of course, you know, he had the big band and he had some wonderful singers like Ella Fitzgerald and Sarah Vaughan uh, singing with them. And, but l as I said before, the music was secular and there was a lot of scatting. So that, that is something that was uh, transitioned and brought into this kind of uh, sacred element with the scatting and of course the big band and along with the choir, which uh, Duke Elling Ellington integrated that into that. And of course the tap dancing. And he actually toured this piece all over the world, not just the States, but um, in Europe. Sweden. Sweden, London, yes. and, and Westminster Abbey, and he yeah. used the local choirs um, and in Alice every place. And Alice Babs in Sweden, who was a fantastic singer, Swedish singer. Why don't you want to be, by the way, you can sing pretty well, by the way. I don't know if you know <laughs> well, that. Well, that's what I'm insane. curious about. I mean, Roberta Flack, Chaka Khan, yeah. Patti LaBelle, Brian Ferry, I mean, yes. that you were like you were like 22 feet from stardom. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, now, no feet. Yeah, no feet. always, always yeah. 20 feet. I mean, <laughs> how, how much of fun, or maybe it wasn't, I don't know. No, it was wonder a, a great amount of fun. I also uh, did a show with Michael Buble called uh, Forever Swing, oh. where I was Ella and he was Sinatra, just oh. on the precipice of his <laughs> huge, uh, you know, stardom. And so I, I still maintain a wonderful uh, relationship with Shaka Khan and with Roberta Flack, and we did a, a tribute to her. I, I think that it's going to be aired on uh, public television sometime this year where uh, I and Lisa Fisher and People Bryson uh, sing the works of Roberta Flack, the, the songs that oh. she's done with um, People Bryson, and of course, Donny Hathaway and her, her own music as well. You know, so Lisa was here about a month ago, by the way. Yeah, yeah. yeah, she's wonderful. She and we, unbelievable. Oh my God, we had such a good time, but I have CDs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you do have CDs. How do we find them, right. Gabrielle? How you do can we find them on Amazon, mm -hmm. and uh, just Google search Gabrielle Goodman, and you'll find the CDs out there. What's it like singing Ellington? <gasps> oh, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. Um, it's, uh, it's intricate. There are a lot of wide intervals, and that's the distance from one note to the next, which is great. It's a great challenge for me, which I really like. Before we, you sing again, which you're all going to do, what do you think of the Metropolitan Chorale? I know uh, you're in a tough spot. But fabulous. <laughs> and Lisa Graham, fabulous. Yeah. And there's a chance that we might have Duke Ellington's granddaughter, oh. uh, Mercedes Ellington, on with us on the 15th. Yes. Oh, my God. Yes. So yes. what are they singing, and what are you leading next, Lisa Graham? We will be singing Come Sunday, that number that kind of kicked off the entire Sacred Concerts um, featuring Gabrielle, and then uh, a nice arrangement for the choir to follow. Great. You guys are going to come back. Don't put your microphones down loudly. Please put them gently on the <laughs> table. <laughs> you may return very slowly. Oh, that's that beautiful. nicely done. You nicely may return done. to your positions. And once again, here is the Metropolitan Corral with Gabrielle Goodman as soloist led by Lisa Graham. Can we hear it for them as they're walking to their positions? Just amazing. Please. 
dear Lord above, God Almighty, God of love, please look down and see my people through. up you too if you can there's another selection coming with a big surprise in a couple of seconds so lisa graham i, I was thinking uh, when i was when gabrielle was describing what duke ellington did here moving into the spiritual i don't know the history it, was it sort of like uh, uh uh bob dylan going electric meaning <laughs> people were his fans appalled or what was the re reception at the time yeah so this was a, an interesting time where uh, extended <coughs> movements sacred music and, and jazz was just sort of coming about and at also at the crossroads of the civil rights movement um and so 
Ellington was able to, to kind of bridge a gap between different faith communities, um, different racial tensions, and basically said, uh, I get to say to the world now what I've said in private on my knees. And he was a man of deep faith, and he, he said this was one of the most important things he ever did. And he, he died just shortly after the last performance of a sacred concerts, about a few months after. So it, it really meant a lot to him personally, and I think opened up a whole genre for others to follow where you know the, the late night jazz of Saturday night was kind of coming into the Sunday morning service and you know uh, breaching that sort of sacred secular moment. I think wonderful. So Gabrielle Goodman and the CDs are online. You can get them <laughs> online. I want to make sure they know that. You also teach at Berkeley College of Music. I do. I mean, Berkeley College of Music has become like huge. Yes. It's like, I mean, is there any better? I, thi I think we have, uh, in the divorce department now, we have 1,800 singers, students. Wow. So yes, it's huge. <laughs> it and continues to grow. And what do you tell them about pursuing a career? Because it's very tough. It is tough. Um, you really have to love it. You know that, uh, that the road is not always straight, that there will be pitfalls, and you have to love it en enough to stick with it. Um, you have to learn the intricacies and all of the aspects of music, the theoretical part of music, and so many different, and of course, vocal technique and things of that nature. And so, and you have to learn how to be a show person and smile when, when things are not so lovely. <laughs> you <can> just go, <laughs> you know. But, um, but it's a business, so get yourself a lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> because, you, I mean, it's, you know, it's really important to know at least some of the business aspects of it when you're going into this as uh, having a career in the, in the music industry. It's not just standing up and singing. It's, you know, some of it is contracts. Every time I signed a recording contract, I had to get a lawyer. You know, I, I, I knew certain legalese, but, you know, I consulted Miss Flack. I said, can you tell <laughs> me about this clause, you know? Did you really? I sure did. And she said, well, I can tell you about Ms. this, Flack. but I also uh, put you in touch with my lawyer, who, who became my lawyer at the time. So, so you do have to have sort of a team uh, to help you. You left one thing out, by the way. And you also, I assume, have to say that if you're ultimately as successful as Berkeley grad John Mayer, don't be an a-hole. Is that <laughs> and you're right. Is that you not? Know what? Is that I not? do say that. I say don't be a jerk. You're an a-hole. Whatever. whatever. That's what you I You know, mean, because yeah. nobody will want to work with you if you're a jerk. You know. Right. And so people, people have worked with me for a couple of decades. <laughs> that's a good point, Jim. That's a very she excellent seems point. Relatively it's happy. easier for men to be jerks than women, though I would say, generally speaking. So, uh, speaking of men, speaking of men, I think of something that I think is is I haven't seen in ages, and we've got a preview of it before. We have. Uh, Ian Berg, who's going to be tap oh, dancing amazing. in amazing. this next song. Can we hear a little bit about tap dancing from Ian or from somebody From Lisa. Here? Well, tell sure. us about it. We're well, hear Ian uh, in a minute. this, this uh, is a percussion solo. Ian, you want to say something? It's a percussion solo that, that Ellington wrote originally for dancer Bunny Briggs. Um, and it's uh, to the tune of David Danced Before the Lord. So it makes sense. Have a dancer. And if you listen carefully, it's the same tune as Come Sunday. So he just dressed it up again and, and added a few uh, tap shoes. Yeah. You sort of look like a tap dancer. I <laughs> yeah. told that to okay. you. I mean, you do. I mean, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so why, why tap dancing? Um, so tap dancing and jazz have sort of like, tap dance is an a important instrument in the history of jazz music. Uh, we were discussing uh, earlier that like a lot of these big bands, like the Ellington band and Jimmy Lunsford's band used to have tap dancers that would tour with really? the group. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a huge important part of it. Um, you ever tap dance on the radio before? <laughs> I have tap dance on the radio have before. Have you really? Yeah. By the way, we heard you rehearsing, and for those who yeah, say, I can't quite get fantastic. that, believe me, you will totally get it. So so did you like start this when you were seven, or how did well, it come that's about? exactly when I started All right, it, when so I was how seven did years old. How did it happen? Did you see someone uh, on TV, or what? I had a lot of energy, and my mom <laughs> was like, well, the tap dancing class could be it. And then I walked out of the class, and I was like, mom, this is what I do now, forever. This oh is my God. what I do for the rest of my so life. So it was like love at first sight. Yeah. Definitely. Wow. So, uh, Lisa, can you mm. tell us what are what will people be treated to? We'll tell them in a minute how to get tickets. What's happening on the 15th? We obviously know a piece of it, but what's the 
whole deal? The whole deal is that we have, like you mentioned before, this 15-piece uh, orchestra, uh, jazz orchestra, uh, Angel Subrero, uh, fantastic uh, pops uh, trombonist for the Boston Pops, got us a killer band together. Two of our members are here today with Great. us. And so you'll hear the entire arrangement of sacred concerts. Uh, it's actually Incredible. a few pieces from each of the three different sacred concerts that he wrote over those years. So it's, uh, it's a medley. Of course, we'll hear uh, Gabrielle and, and dance, and we'll have a few, just some popular Ellington tunes as well by the band, Take the A Train. We have a, a featured soloist from our own choir going to sing All of Me. And um, hopefully, as uh, Gabrielle mentioned, that Mercedes Ellington will join us and do a bit of performing herself. What well does Mercedes way, Ellington sorry. do, by the way? She sings, she's, she's a professional she's dancer a professional in Broadway. Dancer. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Uh, okay. By the way, you're going to describe uh, in a second what this third piece is going to be, mm -hmm. and we will say it a second time, but if you want to get tickets, and you should, it's the 15th, Sunday the 15th, 3 o'clock, First Church in Cambridge, Metropolitan Chorale, with an E on the end, dot org slash tickets. We'll give you that address again. What are we hearing this time, Lisa Graham? Well, this is David Danced before the Lord, and it's again the Come Sunday melody that you just heard, but uh, dressed up in some rhythm. Um, and, of course, uh, starring Ian as the soloist. He did mention, though, that he could share the stage with you if you wanted no, to. No, he and I have danced <laughs> many a time together. That's what I heard. I figured give him the damn thing himself today. Thank you. I'm it's so very generous. sick of having the spotlight. <laughs> We've all seen you tap. So <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Thank you. We have, actually. Uh, you want to give that microphone back to Gabrielle? And uh, so here they are, uh, the Metropolitan Chorale yet again, led by Lisa Graham with Ian Berg. You say on tap or... What, what is he doing? <laughs> Tapping, tap dancing, whatever you're doing. Here they are, let's hear it for the Metropolitan Corral. Thank you. 
was absolutely amazing. Lisa, you want to introduce the introduce, members yeah, of the Can you put the headphones on and introduce your go? performers? That was unbelievable. We need Mike on Lisa, please. Thank you. Here we go. On the keyboard, Rebecca Klein. Yep. Greg Let's Ryan. Let's applause till we announce Greg everybody. Ryan on the bass. Right. And of course, Ian Berg. And of course, uh, representatives from the Metropolitan Corral, Atuti. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. You. This was absolutely, that was that was, I've you. never seen anything like that in my life. That was unbelievable. <laughs> unbelievable. Thank your mother, Ian Byrne, <laughs> for, uh, <laughs> for sending you off to tap dancing school. Thank you so much for being Go here. Go see him on Ray the 15th. Azure, thank you so much. Uh, a joy to be here. It was a joy and thank for you us so too. much, uh, Gabrielle, too. And thank you, for everybody, for coming in. Lisa Graham is the music director of the Metropolitan Chorale, conductor of the choral program at Wellesley College, soloist Gabrielle Goodman. She's a professor of music at the Berklee College of Music and the voice department. She's performed in both classical and jazz idioms with the Syracuse Symphony, the Baltimore Symphony, the Baltimore Opera, the National Symphony, and a bunch of great stars, including Roberta Flack and Chaka Khan. And thank you to the Metropolitan Chorale. They'll wrap up their 2021-22 concert on Sunday, May 15th at 3 o'clock at the First Church in Cambridge. You can get tickets at Metropolitan Chorale with an E dot org slash tickets. Thank you again very much for coming in. You are listening to Boston Public Radio 89.7 GBH. Great. What happens if abortion restrictions make motherhood compulsory? What is it like to mother across borders or from behind bars? And just who gets a chance to hear that most precious and piercing of names? Mom! Mom! I'm Melissa Harris-Perry, and that's next time on The Takeaway from WNYC and PRX. This afternoon at 2, here on GBH News 89.7. Funding for our programs comes from you and Northeastern University, announcing the Burns Center for Social Change, mobilizing students and faculty to solve persistent public problems, burns.northeastern.edu, and the Boston Speakers Series, returning to Symphony Hall for seven evenings of diverse ideas and world perspectives with New York Times columnist Tom Friedman, author Eric Larson, and astronaut Scott Kelly, bostonspeakers.org. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio, Jim Browdy and Marjorie Egan. You know what's a member of the Boston Public yeah. Library? I have two things to say. One, it's amazing that as soon as the chorale finish singing, people are leaving. Don't they know don't we're understand. still here? Yeah, we're still here. It's all, thank you, all three of you. No, whatever. <laughs> By the way, is your name Penny? It's your birthday. It's her birthday. Let's hear it for Penny. Oh, She's here on her birthday. birthday. Penny. Now, let me say one more thing, yes, if Jim. I may. We love being at the library we do. every day. We're we here do. Tuesdays and Fridays, yes, maybe more in the future. You don't need tickets. A Friday afternoon. Free concerts. With a concert like I this. Know. It really, at the library. The library. Really doesn't get any better. Well, they were fabulous. You know, it's music, and we are need music now to get through our many travails. travails. You know, we were supposed to spend the last 20 minutes, which is now a minute and a half, talking about uh, Mother's Day gifts to make up for parental burnout, which we started That's the right. show with. Do you want to share with people in the 60 seconds we have some of the worst Mother's Day gifts we learned about before well, the show? Well, I find this hard to believe people actually did this, but apparently, according to ScaryMom.com, mm -hmm. uh, some children decide to give their mothers 
wiper blades for Christmas. I like that. I, I think it's a good for Mother's Day. I don't like that. Or a pedicure with their mother in law. That's I don't good think that's too. a very good idea at all. Or a gold plated pasta necklace. Did you hear about that, Jim? What are your? Do you give? Uh, do you have? Oh, you have a daughter who's a mother. I know. She, I have a. I have my daughter is a mother. I you have, getting I, her some? I, of course, I'm getting. Well, I spent the whole time quoting from the Jesse Klein article back before that. that I got the Jesse Klein entire book about uh, motherhood and, and 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 being a mom. And also, you, know, you want to give her some nice things for herself. You know, some nice things, bath things, beautiful skin creams, beautiful candles. Well, like that this. Sort Here's of thing. from that uh, scarymommy.com. A gift card for a golf course. My husband. Likes to play at. I don't play golf, of <laughs> course. <laughs> Obviously, he uses it. Let me just say this, by the way. We're attempting yes, to have music here every single Friday we because we love it and it makes us feel great going to the weekend. I don't know if we have anybody booked for next week. If we don't, I've decided I'm going to yodel. <laughs> you know, I, I don't believe I've ever yodeled in public before. I'm thinking a no. small gathering in Cambridge I did once. But we assume we'll have another musical performance next week. If we don't, I will. Uh, I will entertain. Yeah, no, no. I heard multitudes. you yodeling once in the car, Jim, and I think it was a very it was impressive. Quite good. It was a very impressive performance. Okay. Well, thank you very much. We're uh, done. Thank you very much for people that did come down to the that library. So we really great. appreciate you coming. Thank here. you all. Thanks for coming. If you haven't had enough of us, you can keep up with us by 24/7 by way of our podcast called, of course, Boston Public Radio. On Monday, we are so thrilled. At 11 a.m., we're going to have Dr. Anthony Fauci. Uh, Willis, we are th with us. We are thrilled about that. He's kind of the, the guru of uh, COVID across the country. Also, Dr. Cheryl Hamlin. She's the abortion doctor from Massachusetts we interviewed a few months back who's been flying down to Mississippi to help uh, give health care at the state's last operating clinic there. We want to thank our crew, Zoe Matthews, Aidan Conley, Mackenzie Farkas, Rebecca Tauber. Our engineer is John the Claw Parker. Our executive producer is Jamie Bologna. Our engineers today at the library were Say Patel, Sai Patel, and Angela Morero. Thank very much to them. And uh, thank you, Jim. Well, you I have a nice couple of things to say, but thank you for okay. saying that. By the way, the good news for the audience, I will not be yodeling next Friday because Red Shades hip hop artists will perform oh, live here oh, fantastic. next Friday. And secondly, we are so excited about having Dr. Fauci on Monday, somebody we both admire uh, greatly who has done amazing things for this country. If you have a question for him, you can either uh, tweet it to BOS Public Radio over the weekend yep. or text it to our call and text line, 877-301-8970. We'll check them all out Monday morning. We'll try to incorporate as many of them as we can into our discussion with Dr. Fauci. Thanks to Margaret Marshall. Thanks to Cy Montgomery. Thanks to all of you for coming. Thanks to the incredible Metropolitan Corral and Gabriel Goodman and Ian Berg and Lisa Grant. This is a fabulous show. We loved it. Thank you for coming. Have a wonderful weekend, everybody. I'm Marjorie Egan. I'm Jim Brown. Thanks again for coming in today. I hope you can tune in on Monday. And as Jim said, hope you have a great weekend.